crazy. And there's not much in life that's better than that. You guys always show me love. My family and I appreciate it so much. Uh, you guys are the best. You're listening to Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys on the 95.7 The Game Podcast Network. Hello there. This is the Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys, not a podcast. It is a live show today here on the airways of 95.7 The Game. Sam Lubman here, as always, with Joe the Butcher Boy Shasky. And Shasky, we made it. We're finally a big boy show now. We're not just a uh, we're not just a lowly podcast. We are a real show here on 957 the game. We are less than a week away from Giants opening day. They will be opening the season in San Diego this Thursday. And man, just from where we were on this team a few months ago, a few weeks ago, a few days ago compared to right now, I am so excited for Giants baseball to start up this year. Shasky, glad to have you here. What's got you excited for Giants baseball right now? Just how you feeling today, man? Well, I'm super excited. I got my glove. I got my ball in hand, and I'm I'm pounding my mitt, and I'm ready to go. The smells is what I'm ready for. I went to Oracle Park last night for the Bruce Mahoney baseball game, SI versus SH. It went into extra innings, 0-0, and Sacred Heart ended up winning. Uh, just a great game. But being back at that ballpark, the smells, the smells of the garlic fries as I... Sniff my glove, the smell of dirt and grass and baseballs. You know, baseball just, it brings all the senses. And and as the sun is is kind of out today and we, we've been dealing with rain for the last couple of months, like, I'm just, I feel like the sun is out on a new era of Giants baseball. And, and Sam, I want to start right here. Is this the best offseason that the Giants have had since 2012? And I'll give you a chance to get in here, but like, 2012, they they acquire Melky Cabrera. You get Buster Posey back from a big injury. Um, you, you you get a you get a, a healthy Matt Cain ready to rock and roll, and and Bumgarner with a full season under his belt, and and Crawford with a full season under his belt at the big league level, and belt the same thing, and 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 you're just adding to it. You make a shrewd trade to go get Angel Pagan. Um, you know Brian Wilson. You ended up losing obviously that year, but. I feel like this offseason, you got a, a legitimate power hitter in Jorge Soler. You got a arguably best contact hitter they've had since Buster Posey and Jung Hoo Lee, who is going to be an excellent defensive center fielder. You got the best starting lefty who was available in the market. Some say overall starter. Uh, I, I think he got the best defensive third baseman, Nolan Arenado notwithstanding. And it just feels like all the young guys are starting to pop here at the end of spring training. This feels like the best offseason they've had in over a decade. I honestly cannot remember the last time the Giants had an offseason that was this exciting. Now, I think you do have to go back to that before the 2012 offseason. And even then, I mean, that trade for Angel Pagan, it didn't, like, send shockwaves no. out there. It was kind of a, a low-key, under-the-radar trade. Uh, but you're looking at a team, the Giants, who, yeah, I mean, this is probably one of their best offseasons in a long time simply because they just... They haven't really dived into major activity in the offseason like this for, for quite a while. Uh, I'm thinking about that that 2015 to 16 offseason when they brought mm-hmm. in uh, Johnny Cueto and Jeff Smarja. That oh. was, I thought, was a, a good offseason in that they really kind of bolstered a rotation that desperately needed it. But even then, that 2016 team, we remember how how rough that bullpen was. There were probably things they left on the table yeah. in that offseason. Going back, I mean, what you got to go back to... What, December 8th, 1992, the last time the Giants had an offseason this big. I, I was two days away from being born. Like, that's loud. Of course, the day the Giants signed Barry Bonds, for for those who are unaware. Yeah, Shasky, this has been one of the best offseasons that I think they can have in, in my lifetime. Hands down, though, the best offseason that Farhan Zaidi has had since he took over the, the reins of the San Francisco Giants uh, before the 2019 season. I mean, we're talking about how just how we were feeling about this team, you know, a few months, weeks, days ago. How about the feeling on Farhan Zaidi and how much that has flipped? I mean, my guy is out there cracking, you know, not very good jokes uh, at Blake Snell's entry press conference, uh, introductory pre- press conference. And we're just like, eh, whatever, you know, let Farhan have his fun. Like that, that's where we're at now with, with the Giants and with Farhan Zaidi. I mean, Shasta, I think that's another one. Just how much has, has Farhan Zaidi just contribute to the excitement of this season, which is a wild thing to say, considering that, you know, Bonte Hill and I, just a few months ago, we were at that, you know, at Oracle Park mm-hmm. in that dugout, grilling Farhan on where this team is. 
Bonte and I, we look kind of silly now for how much we went at Farhan that day. Well, you know, I think a lot of Giants fans uh, were frustrated and exasperated. And, and, and just think of it this way. Like, we all want the team to be good. <laughs> we all want the team to win. When this team was humming, they were a juggernaut. And I'm not just saying locally in Northern California. I mean just nationally. You always see their fans on the road. You always see this team with good attendance numbers. And there were always a team in the top upper echelon of payrolls. And I think that that... Shows to how powerful the brand is, just the Giants brand. And let's call it what it is. It took a hit the last couple of years. But here's what I would say. As down as I've been on Farhan, I'm an equal opportunist. And I think a lot of fans are. Prove us wrong, and we will give you the benefit of the doubt. And I think right now, obviously, they got to play the real games. And, and you know, you just look on paper, and they don't look superior to the Dodgers. But that's why they play the games. And I'm looking at what Farhan's done this offseason. And then you see Matos look really good in spring training, a guy they've hung on to and hung on to. You hear about Kyle Harrison coming on. Could he be the power lefty arm that, that you had in Rodon who left, that you had before in Madison Bunger, although he wasn't necessarily a power pitcher? Um, you could see where this thing's starting to take shape with the young guys. Throw in Patrick Bailey behind the dish, who had a nice year last year. Luciano hitting one off the scoreboard yesterday. An absolutely. And then you tear. add in these, it was a tank. You add in all these free agents, and yeah, a lot of them are on pillow deals. One or two year deals with some opt outs. But right now, I feel really good about this team. And here's the key the young guys have got to contribute at some point this year, because if all goes well, and this team gets to the playoffs, you've got to be able to bankroll something into next year. Mm -hmm. And so if guys opt out, it's not the end of the world. You have payroll flexibility, but you have to have some young pillars. And it feels like jung -Hoo Lee, Patrick Bailey, Luciano, Matos, Harrison, Camilo Duvall, who have yet to reference. Mm -hmm. They've got some young pillars. Absolutely. The young pillars. And the young pillars of late, as you mentioned, in spring training, they have been starting to show out. I'm curious to see uh, which one of these young guys will be on the opening day roster to start the year. We'll get into that later on at some point, I'm sure. Mark Luciano, Luis Matos, even some of the other, the, the less heralded guys like Tyler Fitzgerald, Casey Good Schmidt, call. who we saw lots of last year. I'm curious to see how he fits into the Giants' plans this year again with Matt Chapman now on board. Uh, the Marco Luciano thing is going to be fascinating just because... Mm. I mean, Shasky, a week ago, he looked like we're, we're wondering if he's ever going to take hold in the big leagues. And I want to just kind of run through the, the the incredible week that Marco Luciano has had. Last Saturday, the Giants were playing the White Sox, and uh, he had a bad day that day. He went 0 for 2 with a couple walks last Saturday versus the White Sox. His average dropped to .083. Mm. Since then, he had a pinch hit appearance against the Rockies on Sunday. Went 0 for 1 there. Batting average is down at .083. Zero eight zero. You never want to have a batting average where a number is sandwiched between two two goose eggs he like that. He was batting Jerry Rice. Basically, yeah, he was. Oh, Jerry. That's basically what it was there with uh, with Luciano. Since then, though, our guy has seriously turned it up. It was two for three with a double against the Reds on yeah. Monday. That was a four two win. Then on Tuesday, he didn't start versus the Royals, but he did go zero for one with a walk. Uh, the next day against the Angels, one for one, two RBIs and a couple stolen bags. Then on Thursday against the Brewers, two for four, four RBIs, his first home run of the spring. Uh, then on Friday, one for one, a double, three walks, a pair of runs uh, versus the Cubs. And then, of course, yesterday he you know struck out twice looking, but then he hit that absolute mammoth shot off his shoulder on the scoreboard. And it was it was during the Jung Hoo Lee interview. And Jung Hoo Lee's face was was all of our faces. He just <laughs> mouth agape in awe of this absolute rocket that is heading out towards the scoreboard there. I mean, how cool is it? You got your picture on the scoreboard there, and you're hitting a home run off yourself on the scoreboard. That's what Marco Luciano did yesterday. I don't know where he starts the season at, Shasky, and, but we're talking about what makes you excited. I always remember, I went and in 2021, I drove out to Stockton to see a San Jose Giants-Stockton Ports game with 19-year-old Mar Marco Luciano in the lineup. In the seventh inning, he hit one of those famous taters that he hit yesterday. He hit another one of those out to straightaway center field. And I just came away thinking, I forget, I forget what the score was that game. I just remember that entire night on the drive back from Stockton thinking, that guy is going to look so good in the middle of this lineup someday. And someday is coming close. I don't know where we're going to be at, though, with, with Marco Luciano overall, though. The excitement's there. What do you expect to see from Marco Luciano as we as we break out of the season? I, I think it's the great unknown. Uh, it's the great unknown, but the power looks intoxicating. When you take a pitch that's 
off the outside corner and you drive it to left center off the scoreboard. Again, I'm going to ask you out loud, and don't give me Mac Williamson. Don't give me some 4A player who wasn't no, very that's good. That's the like, name. Like, and I love Hunter Pence. I love Buster Posey, Brandon Bell. Those guys didn't have intoxicating power. That's not, well, that's not what I'm saying. When you have Jorge Soler, okay, and when you have a kid like Luciano who, who looks like he can mash, I mean, he looks like he can mash. You're looking at Fernando Tatis like power, right? Mm-hmm. When was the last time the Giants had that? Bonds, Kent, Moises Alou. I mean, we're going back 20 years. I mean, to answer your question, Shask, I mean, the last time the Giants even developed power like that is probably never, maybe. I don't know. I mean, how, how goes a power how, of a power well, hitter I with Chihili Pablo, Davis? Like, I thought Pablo might develop into that, and, and then a lot of things happened, and he ended mm-hmm. up being more of a, you know, a, a contact hitter than a power hitter because that first year for him, the rookie year, 25 jacks, you know, 300 yeah. batting average, 90 he was RBIs. more of a contact just, hitter, though. As a rookie, you thought that that was spectacular. Mm-hmm. So, I, But I'm just saying, like, I look at this team right now, and you have the makings of a legitimate threat to be able to make damage in the playoffs, not just make the playoffs, make damage. Why shouldn't they be going after the NL West is what I'm saying. Yeah, absolutely. We do want to hear from from the listeners. We are going to get some callers on eventually at some point. Uh, we do want to hear from you. Uh, we want to hear from you guys on YouTube as well. Shout out to YouTube and Twitch. Of course, that is brought to you by First NorCal Credit Union. Update your upgrade your savings dividend. Opened a First NorCal first class money market today. Shout out to the Comcast Business Text Line. And again, if you like what you're hearing here, what you're hearing on the on the air today. Sam Lubman, Joe Shasky. This is the Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys podcast doing our live uh, 2024 San Francisco Giants preview show. Uh, If you like what you're hearing, be sure to check out the podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Be sure you're subscribing to the podcast. Like, review, share. Tell everybody you've ever met to give it a listen. We're going to be coming at you all season long with all the best Giants content because that's what we do here on Garlic Fries and Baseball. Guys, Shasky, you talked about how that power from Marco Luciano makes you excited for what could happen if the Giants make the postseason. What gets me most excited, though, it's not just Luciano. It's not just Jung Hoo Lee. It's not just the free agent signings that Farhan brought in. It's I'm looking at that pitching rotation that the Giants have right now. It's not complete right now. There is some assembly still to be required. But I look at this pitching rotation, what it could be. I said it at the beginning of the week on the morning rose, part of Final Thoughts. You let this Giants team get into the playoffs with this potential rotation of Logan Webb, mm. Blake Snell, Robbie Ray, Kyle Harrison, Alex Cobb. I'm feeling about as good with that rotation as I did probably with the 2010 rotation of Lincecum, Kane, Bumgarner, and Sanchez. Like, that's how good I feel about this rotation right now. Um, It's not going to be as pretty, I think, throughout the season. Again, I don't know where Blake Snell's going to be at the start of the year. It sounds like he's going to need a little bit of a ramp up uh, just because of how late he signed. Alex Cobb, probably not going to see much of him until the end of April at the earliest. That's all right. Uh, Kyle Harrison will be interesting how many innings he gets. Robbie Ray, obviously, he won't be back until after the All Star break. But come August first, Shasky, when we finally have the 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 Giants' own Avengers finally assemble, it feels like hold on to your hats because it's going to be a wild run those last two months. Look, they did a great job with Gosman and Rodon in back to back years, and, and that was that was beautiful. The Rodon, there were some question marks on like health. Gosman had never really truly figured it out. I, this Blake Snell move, I mean. I think this is going to be a spectacular move for them. I, I'm not saying this is exactly equivalent, but it's got Jason Schmidt-like vibes. Where This is a guy who can carry your entire staff for a month or more. And when you add him to Harrison, who's a young guy, and he's got a lot to prove, to Alex Cobb, who's been brilliant the last couple of years, Robbie Ray eventually, and the key for me is Logan Webb flying under the radar. I think Logan Webb was tasked to carry the load last year. The lack of bullpen uh, helped down the stretch because they had been taxed so bad because they had zero starting pitching. Think of how many times they employed the opener. Mm -hmm. Like, just think about it. As a Giants fan, it was... It was exhausting. It was exhausting before August even came around. So now Logan Webb, who led baseball with 14 appearances into the seventh inning or later, okay, or excuse me, past the seventh inning. Right. um, You're looking at a guy who can go deep. Blake Mm -hmm. Snell, yeah, he's a five-and-dive guy, but just look at the innings logged. 
He is consistent, and he's going to give you 160, 175. This staff needs it. Outside of Alex Cobb, nobody eclipsed over 125 last year no. um, outside of Logan Webb. So they need guys to give them good innings, but they need to log innings because I love the bullpen, but I don't love the bullpen if it's out there every single day trying to patchwork five and six innings. I agree with you, and that's why I think this this first month of the season is going to be very interesting uh, in terms of just how they use, use their pitchers because – Again, I'm not really quite sure when Blake Snell will be full go, ready to go. Um, I mean, there's I was I was texting with George Contos uh, the the other day. Uh, let, let me get the drop here, doing double duty talking and uh, and running the board. And I asked him just kind of like in a situation like Blake Snell, a guy arriving to camp as late as he is, is there going to be a long ramp up here? And he was just like, eh, he's a guy who you know, give him a couple weeks, he should be ready to go. You know, give him two two three starts preseason, he'll be locked in. So. It sounds like, yeah, I don't know what Snell will look like at the start of the season, but that month of April, you're going to have Logan Webb. Obviously, he's locked in. Mm -hmm. We'll see what we're getting from Kyle Harrison. It was uh, a a bit of a bumpy start for him yesterday, Shasky. I don't know if you caught any of his outing against the Diamondbacks yesterday, but uh, he got into a basis loaded jam. You thought, oh, let's see if he can work out of this here. He he got, I think it was Lords Goriel uh, Jr., struck him out on a beautiful slider in the dirt. And you're thinking, all right, here, get the double play. Get out of this. I like what you're doing here. And then he gives up a, a triple to the gap, and it's like, eh, well, you know, thank God it's spring training. <laughs> but so I'm kind of curious what we're going to see from Kyle Harrison. He had a lot of great moments in in his very brief appearance last year. The rest of the rotation after that, Jordan Hicks, um, we really uh, brought him up. We really haven't no, and I'm he is, I think, a very interesting X factor for this Giants rotation. Is he a wild card? More of a wild card than X factor for you? Wild card, X factor, swing man. You could put whatever term you want on it. But early on, I mean, the thing about Jordan Hicks, I mean, we, we know his, his thing is he throws hard. He throws yeah. absolute gas. Guy throws 103 like it's nothing. Um, but it's how long he could do that for. When you're a reliever, it's easy to come out and throw gas for one inning because that's it. That's all you got to do that night. When you're a starting pitcher, you know, you can't just throw all that gas right out in the first inning. Justin Verlander, you know, is, is a good example of that. He's a guy who, you know, he was capable of hitting 100 whenever he wanted, but he built up to it, though. He didn't yep. just start coming out the gate throwing 100. It's something you got to build up to. So I'm curious with Jordan Hicks just kind of handling a starter's workload, which he's never really done before, Shasky. He he's, he's took one attempt to be a starter back in I was, uh, 2022. I think he had like seven, eight starts. None of them really went all that well. Um, and so he's, he's going to have to kind of change his approach a little bit. Uh, you know, I watched, you know, went down, down a, a Jordan Hicks rabbit hole just to kind of see, you know, how good he looks on the mound. And all of his pitches, you, 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 you look at the pitch count and it's all like under 15, you know, what pitch of, of, of that day he was at. There's very few outings or very few highlights of him throwing a pitch after pitch number 30. So he does not work very deep. I'm not sure how many innings, like if you, could you, could we expect Jordan Hicks to give us five solid innings, uh, Every every start here, at least in this first month, uh, to no. start the season. No, I mean I, I don't know what to expect from him. But here, here's what I would say: like as frustrated as I've been with the way they've utilized pitching the last, let's say, three seasons, they have gotten some decent success out of certain guys. Like Sean Mania was a starter for a long time. They turned him into that swingman role coming in after the opener. It was one of the best years he's had in four or five seasons. Mm-hmm. I mean, they did squeeze the juice on that. Jacob Junis. You know, I don't think he's a traditional starter. I feel like they they squeeze the juice on that too. I I feel like they've done some decent things with some of these guys. Brebia comes to mind, and uh, what's the guy with the beard that they had a couple of years ago? I think Brebia was that guy with the beard, wasn't he? Uh, well, then maybe I'm I'm forgetting somebody. There but- was uh, there was. Well, in terms of they used as as, as openers, or? Yeah, they just use a variety of different guys. Yeah. And I just Ryan Walker was another one. Last Ryan year. Walker, absolutely. Like Tristan Beck is somebody that I don't know where his health is at. Mm-hmm. I think him and Jordan Hicks right now feel very interchangeable, and I think you can you know go back and forth and oscillate between the two of them. I, I do think they have a nice variety of arms because if you look at like Harrison slinging it almost three quarter Bumgarner style, Hicks is blowing it as, as fast as possible. Logan Webb's not a speed gun guy. He sits ninety ninety one. 92, going to throw that splitter, that sinker. So I just, I like the variety of arms that they have. Snell much more over the top. I think it, I think it really messes with a lot of lineups out there. So I don't know what to make of Jordan Hicks, Sammy. Like we got to kind of, I know, kinda let, I think- let it play out. But here's the guy that you didn't bring up that I think is going to have a huge impact on the, on the staff. What about Patrick Bailey? Mm-hmm. It, it feels like a lot of these guys like throwing a Patrick Bailey. 
Yeah, I mean, he's become one of the he's already become one of the premier defensive catchers in baseball. Um, I was reading Bruce Jenkins in the San Francisco Chronicle yesterday. Was um, he kind of you know wrote a very excellent story about just kind of comparing the 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 Giants and the Dodgers and and how much they've closed the gap. And he brought up the catching situation, you know, Patrick Bailey versus Will Smith, who, you know, I mean, you you brought Gabriel Moreno in Arizona. I think mm-hmm. Will Smith right now is the is the number one catcher in the NL West right now. Uh, he's just been dynamic ever since he he debuted with the Dodgers, as much as that, you know, pains me to say. Um, and while, you know, Smith may have the advantage there, Bruce Jenkins, again, the grand sage, he's been around for a while. He's seen a lot of great baseball played. He said Patrick Bailey's one of the best defensive catchers in the National League already. Um, which is incredibly high praise because there's a lot of very good defensive catchers in this in the league already. Gabriel Moreno, Will Smith, uh, Real Muto. There's a lot of great catchers in this league. Patrick Bailey already up there with the glove. Um, I don't know if he's a top ten overall catcher in baseball just yet, but defensively, we saw like he's great behind the plate, great pitch framer. How many strikes did he steal last year with that ability to snap that glove back into the strike zone? And we also saw the ability to throw guys out. Like he has got a great arm there. It may not be the, the greatest cannon ever, but it is a very plus arm. And he's a guy that he's a great general behind the plate to have there. What's the recipe to win in this in this ballpark, in this division at the big league level for the Giants? What has been the recipe, Sam? The most successful recipe they've ever had, Chasky, it has been when they focus on pitching and defense and, and, and gap to gap hitting. That there is what you we go. it was the recipe that go. They used to win three World Series championships in five years. And when Farhan got here a few years ago, it seemed like they they seriously deviated away from that strategy. And I understand why. Like I understood at the time why. Baseball was getting very, very power heavy. The three true outcomes were just all over the place. I wasn't a fan of it, but it was working for teams. You saw teams like the Red Sox, the Astros, the Dodgers. Like They were just hitting home runs like they were nothing. And then you had the Giants trying to string runs together. It just, it was not working out. So I understood why the Giants tried to go in that power heavy approach. And it did work for one year in 2021. But the reality is, that's just not how it works here in this ballpark. And no, wouldn't you say the rule changes have forced you to put the ball in play and be more athletic defensively? Absolutely. And so the premium on defense up the middle is back where it was a decade, two decades, three decades I ago. Agree. Like, yeah. look who's good right now. Atlanta, Houston, Philadelphia. I mean, no slouches with the gloves. I, Kyle Schwarber notwithstanding. But you get what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. Like, I think strength up the middle. And then, obviously, having the pitching staff. Now, the Texas Rangers invested heavily on their middle infield and obviously finally paid off for them. Um, I would say that they're more of an outlier because of how weak their bullpen was and how they kind of, not that they got away with it, but they minimized that that was a weakness for them. Uh, and I look at the, the Giants' bullpen. How many bullpens can go up against the Giants' bullpen right now? Because that was another hallmark of, of what made the Giants great in the early 2010s through 2015. Like, having that elite bullpen is a weapon, but you got to get it to October. And I Absolutely. think that was the problem the last couple of years. They had zero starting pitching, and they were depleted by the time they got to August. I, I love adding, adding Jung Hoo Lee. I think this guy... I picked him up in all my fantasy leagues. I think he's going to be a stud. Uh, From what I hear, a little birdie. Defensively, he's much better than they even anticipated. Offensively, he's going to put the ball in play, and that is a key. I think minimizing the strikeouts, having guys on base with guys behind him in the order, hitting, that's going to be huge for this team. There's just too many strikeouts on the team the last couple years and way too many errors. It it was way too okay for these strikeouts as well. Like That was what really irritated me over the last two years was – you 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 saw this team striking out all the time, and like no one was asking like why is this happening? Like are we why are we okay with this? Like why are we all of a sudden okay with strikeouts? Strikeouts like if you're hitting home runs at the same time, that's one thing. But the Giants were not doing that, and you are you're right. You are seeing far more contact now in this lineup. And again, we're talking about kind of what's making you excited for this season. We do want to hear from you guys eventually uh, once we unlock the lines here. You know what is making you excited? You know. The moves that the Giants made in this offseason, the moves that Farhan Zaidi made this offseason, excited me not just because the moves themselves. It wasn't just Jung Huli, it wasn't just Matt Chapman. Adding those guys alone was not all that excited me. It's what those additions represented to me. And what those additions represented to me was a team that has admitted that the way we tried to do things the last few years was incorrect. 
and we need to make a serious adjustment if we want to win baseball games or even keep our jobs. And part of that was, yeah, Farhan, he had to fire Gabe Kapler. A lot of people wanted Farhan to be a part of that firing, but Farhan was given a second chance to grow, adapt, evolve, you know, improvise, adapt, overcome, and he did that this offseason. He signed a guy like Jung-Hoo Lee, signed a guy like Matt Chapman, and what that told me is that this era of we want to just hit the ball out of the park all the time and then whatever else happens after that, it's whatever, it's over. It was my way of seeing that Farhan Zaidi looked at himself in the mirror and said, you know what, forget the power, forget the, the, the eschewing of defense, we want gap-to-gap hitting, we want defense, we want guys who can you know actually give us innings as a starting pitcher, not as an opener. And I want to get into this on the other side here, Shasky, because it seems like Farhan Zaidi has completely flipped his narrative uh, in one off season. I'm not saying that if you're out on Farhan, it's time to jump back in. I'm not saying that if you were always in on Farhan, it's time to start celebrating. But Farhan Zaidi's stock is on the rise, and it is because of this philosophical shift that I've seen take place well, uh, throughout this off season. And yeah, you're saying? No, I want to elaborate on this yeah. on the other side because to me. They're operating like a big dog, Mm -hmm. and that's all we've ever wanted. We want the Giants to operate more like the Red Sox and Yankees did in their primes than, say, the Pittsburgh Pirates. Exactly. This is not about just making profit. This is about trying to win another World Series. And I got two acquisitions for me that were indicators that they're acting like a big dog. Awesome. We will get into that on the other side. It's Sam Lubman. That was Joe Shasky. It's Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys previewing the 2024 San Francisco Giants season. On the other side, how Farhan flipped his narrative, the big uh, acquisitions for Shasky, and then we already got a special guest out on the bat line. We'll talk to them on the other side as well. It's Garlic Fries and Baseball Baseball Guys here on 95.7 The Game. Are you curious about who offers the best deals on top-rated Samsung, LG, and Sony TVs? The answer is surprising. It's not online, and it's not the warehouse clubs. The best deals on top-rated TVs are at video only. Don't believe it? Then check out the trade-in deals at video only. How about $500 for your...
Hey everyone, good to see you all. I actually just got off the phone with the White House. I called to ask if negotiating three deals with Scott Boris in one off season qualifies you for a Presidential Medal of Freedom. And uh, they said they'd uh, get back to me on that. So um, that aside, obviously it's been a really exciting 48 hours for our organization. You're listening to Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys on 95.7 The Game. Oh, thank you for that rejoin there, Dave. And uh, that was the uh, comedic stylings of Farhan Zaidi, Giants president of baseball operations there at uh, Blake Snell's introductory press conference. And uh, yeah, he is waiting on a call back from the White House after uh, an intense offseason of negotiations with MLB super agent Scott Boris. Signed, uh, I believe, what, three Scott Boris clients? Uh, Matt Chapman, Blake Snell, and Jung Hu Lee. So yeah, that's uh, that's a pretty pretty good work there by Farhan Zaidi there with uh, with Scott Boris. This is Sam Lubman it's along with uh, Joe the Butcher Boy Shasky. It is the Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys live show here on ninety five seven. The game previewing the Giants twenty twenty four season that we are very very excited about. Uh, if you like what you're hearing today. Uh, you can listen to this podcast every week during the Giants season. Uh, make sure you're liking and subscri- subscribing. Check us out on iTunes and Spotify. We're also, I believe, on the Odyssey app. We're basically wherever you listen to podcasts these days. So, again, like, subscribe, and, uh, yeah, be sure to share, re- review, and, and tell everybody about this podcast. Yeah, it's an easy listen. You know, we're going to give you 30 to 40 minutes of just pure Giants Talk and very straightforward. I mean, look, 95.7 The Game's got something for everybody. We know that. Mm -hmm. Our live programming is excellent. But sometimes you're in the car and, you know, maybe you just want straight up Giants talk at any given time. Well, you can find us. and Please hit subscribe. Leave a review. Let us know what you like, what you don't like. And um, and join the Giants bandwagon with us. You know, Sam, I want to start right here. Farhan Zaidi. I've been very critical of Farhan and just the front office and the ownership group Mm -hmm. as a whole, how they've operated the last four or five years. And there's lots to pick apart, you know, pick pick and choose what what triggers you. Right. For some people, it's a retaining Brandon Bell one year too many for others. It's not, you know, hitting the free agent market a little harder after the 2021 season. The the lack of development from the farm. Like there's a lot of stuff to be frustrated with, but the great teams that big time spend in Major League Baseball, they upgrade no matter what, no matter small or big, they upgrade. And I look at two acquisitions, and I'm going to put them in order. First, Matt Chapman. Mm-hmm. J.D. Davis had a really good year last year. Mm-hmm. Now, the bottom fell out, and, and he didn't have a great second half, yeah. but he had a really good year. I think yeah, he, he traded was, for that guy. He was dealing and, with an ankle injury through a lot of that second half that I think really kind of took away – his his power and it, and it really hampered his defense too a little bit. I would agree. And and defensively he showed much more than most people thought from him when he got traded from the Mets to the Giants. And that's a Farhan guy. Normally they would ride that guy one more year. Mm-hmm. Normally they would. And they wouldn't try to spend a little more. The Yankees, the Sox, the Dodgers, you know what they do? Hey, even if it's a one-year deal, we're upgrading. Mm-hmm. We'll, we'll take J.D. Martinez last year as an example. The, the the Los Angeles Dodgers. We'll take Albert Pujols. You know, the Dodgers have done that year after year after year. Uh, think Josh Donaldson when they tried to make a move for him when the Yankees got him, even though he was already kind of, you know, at the end of his career. Yeah. Adding Matt Chapman to me was the kind of move like, oh, Oh, we're, we're upgrading no matter what. And I could see other people, well, it's a one year deal. He could opt that. I don't care. Even if it's for one year, I want to upgrade. And I'm so confident in the infrastructure we have here. If we still want to keep this guy after one year, we'll have the best opportunity to retain him for two, three, four years after that. And mm-hmm. then you pair that up with adding Blake Snell. You added the premier starting pitcher who was available this offseason. Chef As I'm kiss. clapping right now, yeah. Farhan and the front office proved to me they want to operate like a big dog. They want to eat at the big dog table, and I'm here for it. Absolutely, especially, I mean, the last couple years we just thought that he was the, like, we're, we're, he, he would bring up all these reasons why they, the Giants are struggling to sign free agents. He would, you know, kind of bring up the, the idiosyncratic nature of the city of San Francisco. Sometimes he would bring up, you know, the ballpark. You know, I remember when we were, you know, at that post uh, or end of the season presser, in the Giants dugout, and his you know, his thing was, you know, sometimes guys don't want to call in because or t- guys don't want to come here because it's just too cold. 
And it's just like, really, that that's the reason? Um, but what I saw from Farhan this year was just like a guy who said, you know what? Forget those past narratives. Forget whatever people are saying. I'm going to show people that I'm here to mean business here as, as the president of baseball operations. And in doing so, yeah, he put on his big boy pants and he made those big boy signings that you want to see uh, guys like him make. And in one off season, he has erased the narrative that, you know, players don't want to come play in San Francisco. The city is not the issue. We knew that beforehand. No. Whether, I don't know how much he really kind of actually believed that. I remember when I talked to him after the Jung Hoo Lee press conference, um, you know, I asked, you know, I asked him straight up. I was like, you know, what do you, what do you feel about these com or, or, or what did I ask him? I asked basically, I, I basically gave him a chance to kind of walk back those comments and just kind of respond to some of the, the, the negative attention that they've gotten. And he said that, you know, players love it here. He's never actually heard a player bring up the city as being an issue. Um, and how that's never actually been the reason why free agents don't come here. Um, I've told him, I talked to FP about this when, when he was filling in. And he said, you know, a lot of those times it's the wives that are concerned in that situation, mm. not so much the players. Um, the most interesting conversation I had on that San Francisco narrative, though, was actually with Scott Boris uh, at that presser. And I asked him about it. And he said, you know, well, I'm from here. You know, I'll tell players, I'll answer any of their questions about this area, and I'll tell them that's a great area to play in. And to me, that interaction right there is what it completely took out the whole city as an issue narrative because it's not just the players are, are watching insert news source here that says San Francisco's bad. No, they have agents who are in their ears saying, yo, you saw this on the TV? Well, here's the reality of the situation. The reality of the situation is that's all nonsense. Don't worry about it. You're not going to see any of it. So... The whole concept of San Francisco being a, a detriment to free agency, it's its dead now. Farhan put it to bed by making these big boy signings. And as you said, Shasky, they improved this team big time from last year. I don't I think agree. that the team last year was as awful as their record indicated. Um, there were issues, I believe, behind the scenes that kind of just sapped the joy out of that team. And that was a fun team uh, the first half of the year. Yeah. And Would you also, at, hmm. at, at, like, I think there was the front office and the organization as a whole, not that they were quote-unquote cheap, but that they were more worried about making profits than competing. Don't you think that that was a rhetoric, just from Giants fans in general, fair or not? Wouldn't you agree with me on that? Yeah, I definitely think that's the, the, the cheapness. I mean, when... Not cheap, not cheap, but, but that that... They, you know, oh, well, you got to know that Aaron Judge starts at $400 million for you mm -hmm. because you got to add in the $100 million tax of coming to California, being on the Giants, and, and understanding that it's, you know, this situation is not as good as the others. When you forfeit the amount of draft picks that they did to sign these guys on one and two year deals, when you go into the luxury tax the way they, they did with losing some of your international spending and your, and your pool money and things like that. So like to me, those are, we're trying to win now moves. That's what it signaled to me. And I think they deserve credit for that. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we've been wanting this team to kind of be in a win now mentality yes. for the last couple of years now. Um, and it seems like, you know, we, we laugh at the warriors for trying to do their two timeline plan. I'm not saying the Giants are trying to do their own version of the two timeline plan, but with this setup they have right now, this is a win now team. They have yes. a team that can, it is absolutely, the playoffs are the expectation this year. This whole, we want to play competitive games in September and hopefully we'll be in it the, the last week of the year. Like, that's that, that is out the window now. You cannot do that. That is not the expectation. I want to see this team playing in October. Um, more than likely, it's going to be in one of the wild card spots. That's fine. I'm totally okay with Why that. Why are you conceding the NL West already? Because even at the end of the day, I still have to. You still have to acknowledge the Dodgers are an incredibly good team. Like, yeah, but they've got wrong. a big cloud hovering over them with this Otani thing. This is a big deal. I think this is a big deal. And and look, when the Giants, when you look at their roster and their pitching. Why not? I mean, who had Arizona representing, and I know they didn't win the West, but who had Arizona representing the National League in the World Series? Things happen. At some point, a natural regression has got to occur for the Dodgers. I know that they've won the NL West 11 out of 12 years. Like I, I understand all of that. I'm just saying I'm not ready to, to give up chasing that NL West banner, and I don't think the Giants will. Oh, no, I'm not saying that the Giants – I guess let me, let me rephrase. I – I obviously expect the Giants to compete for a National League West title. Absolutely. Good. They definitely okay. think they can. I'm not sitting back saying, let's just focus on the wild card. That's not where I'm getting at here. But 
There is a reality I think you need to acknowledge as a Giants fan, and that is that the Dodgers are probably never going to be bad ever again for the rest of eternity. <laughs> like, that's just, until the Dodgers are bad again, I'm just going to assume that it's it's their division to lose every single year. That's kind of where they're at. They're like, with the, they're basically the Braves of the 90s who won, fifth, what, 15 straight division titles yeah. or something like they that. Won World Series. And well, at one point, they just stopped winning. So the Dodgers, it's their division until it's not right now. That's not me knocking the Giants. That's just me taking a look at the reality of the situation that the Giants are in, the reality of what the NL West looks like. And I honestly, I, I'm, I'm not mad at that. Like the Dodgers have done the, the footwork to put themselves in a position to where you're coming into the season just assuming, all right, let's just pencil the Dodgers in for 95 plus wins and first place in the NL West. Like they earned that right. Fair and you enough. know what? I, I, I'll i be kind of okay with that for now. I expect the Giants to push the Dodgers. They've always played the Dodgers well. Um, I mean, here's the thing, Shasti. When, when it comes to divisional placement, where the Giants end up in the playoffs, a part of me kind of thinks the wild card might be a little bit better than winning the division, only because if you have one of those top two spots in, in the playoffs, you get that bye week in the playoffs. Okay, I'll worry about that in September I know, but I mean, that, when, I, when I think, you know, this sets up well for the Giants, I think if they don't win the division, they're still sitting pretty because they don't have to deal with that bye week once yeah. October comes around. Fair point. All right, let's, let, let's do last year versus this year. All we right. can agree. Last year, the pitching wasn't as good as this year. Last year, the everyday lineup is not as good as what's on paper for this year. Can we agree on those things? Oh, yeah. I'd agree there. Yeah, it's okay. pitching. What it's about a, well, the we have manager. a full pitching rotation right now. I know. What about the manager? Is the manager better than who the manager was last year? Is Bob Melvin, and I'm not going to put a number on it. I'm not, oh, he's five games better. He's ten games. I don't know. Is he a better manager than Gabe Kapler? Absolutely. Honestly, if Why? the Giants... If the Giants on the, the end of the year, that team that took the field on game 162 of last year, like October 2nd or whatever that day was, if that exact same team took the field on this Thursday in San Diego, but with this coaching staff, I think they're a better team just on that factor alone. Not just because I think Bob Manager is a better manager than Gabe Kapler, but because Bob Manager has assembled a much better coaching staff Melvin. than Gabe Kapler's po- coaching staff. And... This is no, let's not take a shot at the Giants coaching staff last year. There's a lot of smart people on that coaching staff, but it was very light on actual game playing experience. Mm. You need guys who have actually played this game, I believe, to be coaches. You know, you and I, we've gone back and forth on whether or not you need to play the game in order to be an executive like Farhan Zaidi. Um, you know, you're, you've been adamant that you have to have been playing this game in order to do it. I think there's some wiggle room there. Okay. But when it comes to being a coach in the dugout who wins who wears a uniform, like Kai Correa, I think he very he had a very good understanding for this game. The dude never played an inning of baseball at any level. And I'm sorry, like if that's your number two in the dugout, I, like as smart as he might be, as great of an understanding he as he might have, as great of a feel for this game that he might have, if you've never played the game, I just I can't fully take you seriously as a coach, and I'm, I don't know how players feel in that regard. I've never really asked a player on that uh, in, in that regard. But now you got a, a, a coaching staff where you know Brian Price is your new pitching coach. He's a former manager himself. He's very experienced. You got Pat Burrell back in that cl- in that uh, dugout now as as a hitting instructor. Matt yeah. Williams is now a part of this coaching a staff. Manager, you have legitimate baseball guys on this coaching staff right now to work with these players, that alone, and Bob Melvin, who is a very experienced manager, he's had a lot of success wherever he's gone, like, this coaching staff alone gets me very excited for the improvements that this team has made. Well, then let's look at it this way. Like, I think a lot of people thought that a lot of Gabe Kapler's lineups were coming from Farhan, and the platooning obsession started at the top of the of the, of the front office, if you will. I look at it, this year versus last year. This year, I've got an everyday center fielder, Jung Hoo Lee, signed a multi-year contract. This year, I've got Matt Chapman at third base. He's going to play every single day, and his game logs tell you that. This year, I've got Tyro Stroud at second base. Health barring, because he hurt his wrist last year, he's going to play second base every single day. Last year, he had to play short. He's not a shortstop. To me, he made big strides defensively as a second baseman. Pat Bailey is better than Blake Sable and whoever they had to start the year last year. And I assume he's going to play, what, 110? 
hundred like a hundred twenty games it catches a lot. So mm. I'm just gonna say like hundred and ten. And that's give a fair take. number. I and, think yeah. And it feels like Tom Murphy's getting that backup spot. Maybe it's Joey Bart. I'd still like to see Joey Bart one more time with the big league club before they bid adieu to him because he's out of options. Um, and then and then I look at, at like the corner outfield spots um, and I say, okay, I got Conforto, I've got Yaz. I don't know, you know, what those guys are going to play. 90, 120 games, somewhere mm-hmm. in that range. Health barring because both guys have been dinged up the last couple of years. I can mix in the young guy there. I can mix in Matos. I can mix in Slater over there. Well, that's Those are like two platoon spots. The other platoon spot would probably be shortstop with Nick Ahmed and maybe Luciano. And the other one, first base with Wilmer Flores and and hopefully uh, Lamont Wade Jr. So I now have five guys that are going to play every day. Four guys guaranteed that are going to play every day. That's a big jump up from last year where there wasn't one guy that mm-hmm. I knew would play every single day. Honestly, the only position on the field right now that I look at and will probably have and a so consistent Lara platoon. DH too, by the way, yeah. I forgot. It was a much great. Uh, it was a much bigger improvement over whoever that was. They had a DH last year. I don't even want to say his name right now. Um, he's a very big card game fan. Um, so no, I, you're, you're absolutely right. I think the one position I'm looking at right now that is probably going to be very platoon heavy early on, at least. Might be right field with with Yaz and Slater, though Slater is still dealing with is uh, with issues from a surgically repaired elbow, which does open the door up for Luis Matos, who had a better year at the plate against lefties last year than Austin Slater did. I say that because that was Austin Slater's primary role. He was the lefty masher, so to speak. And uh, you know, Matos has a chance to kind of come in and take that side of the platoon. I would like to see Matos be a guy who can face both righties and lefties. Hopefully we'll see that happen throughout the year. Mike Estremsky can kind of go back into that fourth outfielder role that he's yes, probably more which is, set to, to be a part of. He, he would be... The way I viewed Gregor Blanco during the dynasty years, Gregor, great off the bench. Great as a fourth outfielder. Don't love him as my everyday outfielder. You know what I mean? Like, Absolutely. And that's not to diminish no, him. No, I'm... He, Gregor Blanco is I, I love Gregor Blanco. You know? And, and like, But he can't be your starter every single day. No. At some point, he's going to get... He's going to get into a struggle offensively. A great defender. Like Austin Slater, uh, Yaz, Conforto. To me, if I could only have two of those veterans and mix in Matos, that would be my ideal situation. Yeah, I would maybe. like to see them move on from one of the veterans and give a spot to one of the youngsters. Absolutely. Maybe you can get uh, Elliot Ramos in there, too. Shasky, I want to go to the lines really quick because i got a special yeah. guest I've been leaving on, the home for, on, the, on hold for far too long. Um, I've been going to baseball games since I was... About seven and a half years old. My first ever Giants game was June 17th of all days, uh, uh, 2000 against the Houston Astros. It was the day after I got done with first grade. And the man who brought me, who's coming on right now, Jim Lubman out in Walnut Creek, calling in, making his debut on the 95.7 Game Airways to talk a little Giants ball with us. Dad, how you doing today? So, hey, this is Sam's dad. I can't believe I'm calling a radio show. What about that? Right? I know. I had to really twist his arm to make him do this one. I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. I'm, I'm kind of fighting off tears here because my dad used to call in all the time. So this is great. I love this. This is what baseball is about. Joe, uh, do, all respect to you, Dad. I've listened to your dad, Joe, on the phone. He was, he was awesome. And frankly, there's no way I can follow in those footsteps. Oh, but, no. Uh, I, you're a great guy, man. This isn't what baseball is all about, playing catch with pops, going to games with pops. I'm bringing my son to opening day. Like, that's what baseball is all mm-hmm. about, man. I, 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 I am excited about the season, and I and part of the reason I'm excited about the season is because how excited you guys are. You guys are getting me there. But, but Joe, I'm really excited that you're doing all this debating with Sam and not me anymore. <laughs> 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 That's true, yeah, Dad. He, What's, my dad is. Uh, we spent a lot of years uh, sitting in uh, section one twenty seven, and he's uh, he's had to do what basically uh, Shasky and Bonte do every night, which is listen to me <laughs> talk about Giants baseball. Well, what's the thing that got that has you most excited? Is it a particular player? Is it a philosophical change? Is it the manager? Is it just a new year? Why, why are you optimistic and excited for Giants baseball? I, I've thought about that a lot, and, and it is the aggregate. But I think I think it's Bonte who talks about the idea of. Before this offseason, there was nothing to excite us about, you know, leave, going to the park. You, you didn't want to stay in your seat because you weren't going to miss something. You know, you didn't really care what was going to happen. That's all changed. You know, there's all sorts of things to look forward to, whether it's Jung Ho Lee in the, in the outfield. I'm really excited about shortstop. I mean, I've, it's either been Richie or, or, or Crawford. So what, who, what's next there? Um, the pitching looks good, and, and just the whole vibe with Melvin. I mean, now there's all this stuff cooking, whereas, what, four or five months ago, it was like, let's fire Farhan and burn it down, right? So, <laughs> no, I love it. I'm I, with you, and you know what the, the crazy thing is? Is that 
you know, if these young guys show promise and some of these veterans that they sign start to, you know, play really well, imagine what the rhetoric is going to be about this team come May 15th, Memorial Day, right? June. We'll be feeling it. Giants fans are dying. Look, football's a long way away. The Warriors, who knows? Like, I'm, I'm hoping they go on a deep run. You know, we'll see. But if the Giants can capture our imaginations for the summer, it could be a magical summer. Yeah, you know, what's special about baseball is it's in the background on the radio as you're going about your day, right? You can have it in the office. And, and if they're winning or if they're even in it, you know, you, you kind of got one ear on that and one ear on whatever else you're doing. That's a good vibe, you know. So I, I, I hope. I really hope. Right. I do yeah. too. So, I mean, we were kind of, to, Dad, you've been waiting on hold here for a while. And again, sorry about that. But uh, you heard us kind of <laughs> talking about the where the Giants and Dodgers kind of match up there. When you look at the Dodgers and just kind of the, the team that they have, and you look at the Giants, obviously on paper, the Giant, the Dodgers look so much better. But how much do you feel like the Giants can kind of close the gap on the Dodgers this year? Do you feel like the, the gap's going to be a lot closer this year than it has been in the past? Do you look at the Dodgers as that kind of terrifying death star we've seen them in the past? Or do they feel like, you know what? With this Shohei Otani cloud, does do the Dodgers they feel kind of weak right now? So w- w- waiting on hold for you to stop talking. I'm not. I, I'm used to that, buddy. That's okay. But the uh, right. So you know what? For me, the, the Dodgers are the same way I feel about the Yankees. Right? They are the Death Star. And and I I remember when you played Little League and you would play the Yankees and even those little kid in pinstripes. You know, you kind of hey, wait a minute, that's the Yankees, right? You know, <laughs> and, and it, it's kind of still it's absolutely. In fact, I don't even think in here in the East Bay they even have the Dodgers play in Little League. I don't even think they put those teams on the field. I don't think. No, so, they won't let not. it. Yeah, that's yeah. no one wants to be there. Yeah, right. So it's out of sight, out of mind. You know, so it, it's the corporate enemy. And, and but. I love the pluck. I love the, um, I think you guys are just talking about it. I mean, the, the Giants have kind of put a team together that looks like they can stack up. And, you know, you got to play the game, uh, first of all. And then second of all, so much is it all about health, right? You know, it all looks good on the field right now. It hope springs eternal in the spring. Um, but it's all about health. So we'll see where this goes. I just think we got a fighting chance, which is all I ask. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Me too. How much? I, I, I've Great call. Yeah. I mean, I love it. And Sam, like the, the health thing. It's very important. Alex Cobb got hurt at the end of last year. It feels like he's on a really quick road to recovery. Conforto, what has really hampered him? Injuries. Yeah. Just in his whole career. He got hurt again last year with the Giants. Came back. Yaz got hurt in the hamstring in Mexico City, I believe. And remember he like popped it on the on flying in yeah, on a he was just not the same the rest of the year. Yeah, yeah, Luciano in the minors, what's held him back? Back injuries. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, uh I, I look I, I just look across the board, like Matt Chapman. Part of his decline in Toronto, we were told from one of the guys that covered him every single day, was he got hurt. Mm-hmm. You know, he, he hurt his was pinky or wrist or something. Yeah, I, I think forget. it was a Buck Martinez came on and said that. Uh really quick, hey dad, um how much Giants golf stuff are you buying this year now? So look, dude, I've never met a golf jacket I don't like. So I, love I, it. I own more than I own more than a few of them, but I'm not big on wearing a whole lot of Giants gear. I've got like the, the favorite hat, you know, and just, I, I don't go all out Giants on the golf course, but I, I want to wear like just a hat yeah. or maybe a shirt, but not a whole lot of it, right? You're not that guy all in Giants swag. That's a little over the top, like those black and orange diamond pants. I'm not doing that shit. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's, that's a little more. <laughs> the loud mouth pants. Hey, here's the bigger yeah, question Glove or no glove at the game? So um, I'm a no glove guy because I got to hold the beer, right? So I kind of I rely on the kid sitting next to me to catch yeah, the ball. True. That's always been the deal. That if the ball's coming at me, it's his times. job to catch it. I love it. I love it. I had the glove yesterday. I was out at AT and T. We were all playing catch. It was freaking awesome. I just God, I love going to the ballpark. Definitely. Well, right. I think the kid the kid has two. I know I got to get off. The kid has two balls in our seats. I think so. Yeah, that's about oh. it. So you know, do you? Sammy? Yeah, just the two. I got I got them saved somewhere in storage somewhere. One was from Randy Wynn, and the other was from Joey Votto. And these were late was, swings uh, fouled off into the yes, section? Yes, they were, yes. <laughs> I love that. Joey so, Votto. No, I know, it was like his rookie year, balls. too. It was a screaming yeah, liner right on my dad's head. Saved his life. You saved his the life? The first one bounced off. Bounced off the uh, the the um, the porter go behind us and landed right in his lap. I mean that's the Come true story now. of it, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, hey dad, thanks for calling in. Are you gonna be at opening day? Thanks, pops. I will be there, man. Yeah. Awesome. Look we'll see you, you there. Guys. I'll see you. All right. Keep on. I'm bringing my little guy out there. Look, you know, I, I got a little, a little emotional there, but it's the truth. Like for me, and I know everybody's different, right? But for me, baseball 
is about family. Mm -hmm. And I know you can say that about all the sports. You know, you hear a lot of guys from football like, my mom took me to every practice and played catch with dad in the backyard. But baseball for me is about my dad and my mm -hmm. grandfather and my brother. And now I get to, you know, share that with, with my son and I'm going to bring him out there on opening day. My wife and I, you know, some of our first dates were going to Giants games. And so, oh, that's awesome. you know, going to the ballpark uh, has this familial kind of feel to it. It's not like a football game. A football game, yeah, you tailgate in the parking lot. Yeah, it's not at the most kid friendly environment. Basketball games, they're, they're amazing. Kind of going they're in and out. So yeah. much fun. But it can be difficult with the kids if you're way up top. There's not a lot of like stuff to do. I mean, from some of for young kids, when you go to a baseball game, you can miss a couple innings walking around and doing a lap and going to get cotton candy because of the inventory of games. It's just got much more of a a picnicky, relaxed, old school atmosphere to it, if you know what I'm saying. Absolutely, no, and and, and you you bring up a good point here. We're we're up against it, but uh, I'll I'll blow through this break a little bit. But you you mentioned you know, you're bringing your son there. You talked about how how pops and your grandfather got you involved in baseball, Shasky. Like my dad's the guy who got me involved in Giants baseball. Like I told you, he took me to my first ever Giants game the day after it. first grade, and he was battling pneumonia that day, which I found <laughs> out later on. He, he gutted it through a gutsy performance to take his kid to his first ever game. And I was hooked there and, you know, seeing what Bonds did in, in 2001, that kind of locked me in for life. Um, How old were you then? I was eight years old that year. Jeez. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, this baseball has very much been a, it's a family sport. It's passed down from generation to generation. You know, your grandfather passed it down to your father, who then passed it down to you. And now you're passing it on to LJ. My dad passed it on to me, and I intend to have a child someday who I will pass on to. You know, I, I always say, you know, when I have a kid someday, they can choose whatever they want in life. You know, they could be whatever they want to be, pick whatever career they want to pick, go whatever school they want to go to, even if it's Florida State. The <laughs> one thing they will not have any say on, though, they will be Giants fans. That I was totally the one agree. thing they will not have any say on. So you are listening to the Garlic Fries and Baseball it, Guys podcast. Sam Lubman and Joe Shasky uh, doing our 2024 Giants season preview. If you like what you're hearing today, be sure to check out the podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss any episodes. Dan, I see you on the line there. We're going to get you right when we come back on the other side. And... Uh, I want to have a bit of a more of a Bob Melvin conversation because Shasky, when you when Bob Melvin was first hired, you were a little on the fence there. So I'm kind of curious where Giants fans are at on Bob Melvin. How inspired does Bob Melvin being in the dugout make you feel for this season? And I want to make a case for Bob Melvin why his past uh, failures in the postseason do not have to dictate his future postseason appearances. We'll get into that and more. It's Sam Lubman. It's Joe Shasky. It's Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys here on 95% of the game. I have diabetes. I'm at risk for pneumococcal pneumonia. I have asthma. I'm at risk too. If you're 19 or older with chronic conditions like asthma, diabetes, COPD, or heart disease, or are 60...
You're listening to Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys on 95.7 The Game. It's never going to get old. Sammy. Lee jung Who? This is the jung Who Lee song, correct? For those that uh, don't know? That is correct, yes. I think this guy has a chance to be one of the most lovable Giants since Hunter Pence. Now, it's not saying much. Because there haven't been many lovable ones. Mm -mm. But think about it. Last five years of the new the new guys, who's the most lovable? Of the last five years, the most lovable giant. I would have to say, are we going just position players here? You want to include pitchers too? Go anywhere you want. Well, then if it's going to be anyone, it's probably going to be Logan Webb and Camilo Duvall. It, um, but Logan Webb, people like him, but yeah. is he lovable, quote unquote? You know what I'm saying? Like I think Pablo, Pablo and Hunter occupied an entire mean, yeah. unique dynamic. Like Andres Torres operated in his own little circle. Now Correct. maybe that was just that era of Giants, but it feels like there are certain like when I say Wendell Kim to a certain select old Giants fans, they remember him sprinting out as the third base coach. You just start to smile. He was yeah. lovable. You just loved him. Even Dusty Baker at one point was lovable. Who is like Kevin Mitchell was a guy very lovable. Um I don't know. I just yeah, I, mean, I, I think Jung Hoo Lee has a chance to be one of the most lovable giants. Going to be up there. I do think yeah, I mean Logan Webb, he's he's been on this podcast a couple times. Um I do think the more we see his personality, he'll reach that level too. Other than that, though, I mean, talk about, you know, there really hasn't been a guy in these last few years who you could attach yourself to as a Giants fan and be like, I'm riding with that guy in the way that we did with, you know, heck, even with with guys like Pablo Sandoval, with Hunter Pence, Buster Posey, heck, the way that we, you know, as Giants fans would ride or die for Angel Bagan or Gregor Blanco or Brandon Crawford or your favorite guy, Shasky, Brandon Belt, um, you know, that's just how it was. So I want to go to the phone lines here. Yeah. Uh, I want to start with Dan uh, calling in here. Dan, how are we doing today, man? What has you excited for Giants baseball right now? Hey, great to talk to both you and Joe and, and Sam. Uh, this is Dan, North Cal Sports Network. What's uh, up, Danny? Big, uh, hey, Joe. Hey, good to hear you finally uh, talk to you, per, uh, you know, one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. But, uh, hey, you know, I got to say this. I, I give a uh, A grade for Farhan this offseason. I've been, as you know, Joe, one of his biggest critics, and I don't apologize for it, and I don't think anybody should have to apologize for what he did the first five years. I think uh, he was, you know, this is a top market, as you mentioned. He's playing like a big dog now, which is, and I, and I think what we have been critical of maybe has been a positive in that it pushed Farhan and the Giants to make a move. We couldn't come back and do this for a sixth season, what, what we saw in the first five of all these, meaningless transactions now like you said they're playing like a big dog so i like the moves uh i was against the chapman move as far as a five-year signing when they I'm were first you. talking about it i'm i'm cool with the one you know three years and opt out because you know you better hope he opts out because you don't want a conforto situation absolutely we want him to opt out because that means he had a good year and the Giants, maybe they could re-sign them, or you still got Casey Schmidt in the pipeline. And I just was against them signing guys to long-term and, and blocking some of the young guys. Dan, can I stop about, you for a second? I, I want to continue yeah, talking. Ahead, I, I think you're spot on here. And I did not love, when I saw the, the number, 155-year deal for Matt Chapman, 200 million six-year deal. I was like, no, absolutely not. And to your same point, I wanted to. I, I would have rather have seen what Casey Schmidt has than give a six-year deal to a guy who I believe to be, you know, a very, very, very good player. But like, I question whether he can be the anchor of a lineup for four straight years. When you give a guy that kind of money and that kind of a commitment, you're expecting him to anchor your lineup. Defensively, he's a wizard. I'm talking about Matt Chapman. But I wanted right. to see Casey Schmidt. But for one year. And, and hopefully he opts out because that means he has a great season. I'm okay with it. I still I want to flip over that Casey Schmidt card because I want to see what that guy has. His arm is electric. The glove is electric. It's can the bat develop. And that's why I, I, I have major reservations on, on like what's going on in the minor leagues. But like I'm with you on that. I'm glad they gave him a one-year deal. So on that level, I, I think we're on the same page. 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you guys are talking about who's who's lovable. I think who's going to be lovable is Marco. Ooh. I really do. Where do you think, I think he starts Marco and he, You think he's in the minors or do you, you think know, he's on the opening day roster? Gosh, that is – I mean, what he's done the last week is what we – the potential. I love what other teams do, you know, like the Reds and L.A. Dela Cruz. They just put him there. You know, let's yeah. see what these guys can do. And, you know, I'd rather see him start with Marco. Let him see if he can do it. you got Ahmed in the background. Why not give him a shot, man? He can infuse so much to that lineup if he gets going. That uh, defensively, I understand they want to go with the defense. And Ahmed is a gold glover. But, I mean, we've been talking about Marco for a long time. Five and, years. Uh, you know, yeah. And if he can't do it, you know, give him, you know what my thing is, give him April and May, give him 200 at bats. And if, if he's not adjusting, we saw it with Matt Williams back in the eighties, yep. you know, it took Matt two two or three times. I was there at the ballpark. He looked as bad as any player I've ever seen at the plate. Remember uh, when he, used to, year two, I mean, he would swing through the breaking ball in the dirt every single time. Yes, yes, he didn't even look like he belonged in baseball. I mean, he was so bad. But when he figured it out, I mean, and that's how you figure it out. You got to get those bat- at bats. You know, give give Marco the chance in the beginning, I think. And if he doesn't do it, you can send him down. Maybe he comes back up, but he'll he'll have that in his background of learning what he needs to do to adjust, to make the adjustments. I'm with and you. uh I just, I just think he can add so much. He's got flair. I mean, the double play that he turned the other day. I was watching the game. Um, it was a three-six-three double play. Uh, Flores threw the ball kind of low to his left glove side. He just scooped that thing. You know, not scooped it, but he just went down and in in a great motion went from ball to glove and just threw it. I, I just like his athleticism and it's something the Giants haven't had that excitement you know the ball he hit you guys talked about oh my god off the scoreboard was unbelievable Such a uh, it felt bonzy and did it not yeah yeah I mean <sighs> and and I just think this uh I, I'm, I'm excited about the team where they're at right now simply because what I've been preaching all off season get pitching and if you get into a playoff series, uh, let's say they make the wild card, you know, and it's a five-game series, you throw out Webb, Snell, and Ray or Cobb, and who knows what Harrison does. I mean, that's going to be a tough to beat. I don't care if they're going up against the Dodgers. That could be a team that will be in a five-game series, and then you get into – you win that. You get in – you know, I mean, anything's possible. We saw it with Arizona last year. And, you know, I think the mix of veterans with the young guys and Melvin, I mean, I'm so glad they got moved off Kapler. I mean, that was, and, and Sam, you're right. That coaching staff that they had last year, the last couple of years, I mean, what they have brought in with Matt Williams and, and Bur- Burl and, and Price, guys that are experienced that played the game, it does make a difference. It makes a huge difference. Absolutely. Hey, thanks for your call, Dan. Really appreciate the, uh, you calling in here. A lot to take away from that call there. And um, yeah, I, I do. Uh, I, I, fi- I follow Dan on Twitter, and uh, he is definitely one of the louder anti Farhan uh, voices on Twitter there. But even he's kind of coming around on uh, Farhan Zaidi and, and his tenure with the Giants. And um, I kind of want to th- bounce that off you, Shasky. Um, Mark Willard, he brought this up the other day on, on his show, Willard and Dibs, weekdays 2 to 4, or sorry, 2 to 6. Um, can we be at the place where it's like, you know what, let's come back around on Farhan Zaidi. Maybe he really is, you know, a guy, the, the guy for this job. Maybe he's not, you know, uh, uh, you know as Bonte said, Bobo the Fool. Uh, that's, that's not who Farhan is. Can we come back around on Farhan Zaidi again? You remember last summer, you know, I, I went on a 20-minute soliloquy that uh, would have made the voice of the 49ers blush with how long it was in terms of just going into detail why I kind of stopped believing in Farhan Zaidi. Are we at the point where it's like, you know what? Farhan, you got your groove back, man. You're, you're well, cool again. I think life is 
more about credits and demerits than social media will indicate. Yes. Like, what have you done? Like, do you have pelts on the wall? Like, I, I look at it as an example of Brian Sabian. Brian Sabian got onto the job and made in one of the boldest trades in Giants history, trading for Jeff Kent. But no one knew at the time Jeff Kent would evolve into Jeff Kent. They traded away Matt Williams, like the guy that he just referenced, Dan did. And it was a... It was a trade that did not sit well with Giants fans, period. It, it just didn't. And and then eventually we came around on Brian Sabian. Then at the end of the Bonds era, people were not happy with Brian Sabian. There was a website. This is the early stages of the internet. I was Firebriansabian.com, you know, and a lot of the quote-unquote old-school message boards couldn't stand the guy. We all ended up being wrong. So – Bruce Bochy, same thing. I thought Bruce Bochy was a placeholder. Oh, I retread a veteran. He's here for the mm -hmm. end of the Bonds era. We'll get our real manager once, you know, once he gets flushed out. And we were all wrong about that. Well, Bochy we want really to be a, proven wrong. Yeah, he was but never here, really a young guy thing. person either. But, uh, but again, like, I, about credits and demerits. So once you start to win, we will back off very quickly. People didn't want Mark Jackson fired. Mark Jackson gets fired. Steve Kirk comes in. He wins. Have we thought about Mark Jackson since? Not really. You know? Um, Kyle Shanahan, same thing. And so I look at Farhan's tenure, and he has the one incredible season. But I think most people would say, hey, you know, the bulk of that was Posey, a carryover. Uh, Logan Webb, who was from the prior regime. And, and yes, you shined him up. Crawford, prior regime. Belt, prior regime. And you did a great job piece working the rest. Can you build your own team? Yeah. Can you build your own team? And I think that now I'm looking at it, and and, and the, he has the makings of – it's his team. There are no carryovers. Logan Webb, they gave a five-year, $90 million deal, and he gets credit for that, you know, retaining that guy. Uh, but this is his team now, you know, and, and he has cultivated this roster from top to bottom. And so when you look at how promising it is – now you start getting back into the credits as as opposed to the demerits of the last couple of losing seasons and the way things went. I mean, let's be real. It was unwatchable at times last mm -hmm. year. Well, let's just call it what it is. His manager alienated his roster. His roster was chirping about how they were used within the fabric of his system, and it was not good. Fast forward to this offseason, best third baseman available, best starting pitcher available, I believe one of the better center fielders available on the market. One of the better DHs available. Uh, yes. Check, 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 check. And then your young talent is starting to show promise in spring training. Yeah. Tip your cap for it, It's a great offseason. Yeah, tell your jokes. Stretch your stuff. Um, no, I, I love what Farhan did, this obviously, this year. I'm starting to come back around on him uh, from the departure I, I had last year. I'm not quite ready to, to make the full-on flip. Just for me personally, it takes a while for me to kind of shift my opinion in that sense. Um, I like to let things kind of play out a lot before I truly get to the, all right, I'm going to switch my opinion here. Because especially with baseball, because baseball, it's such a long-term sport. Very rarely do things just kind of happen and change overnight. Um, obviously, we just kind of saw that happen last week with the Giants, but it was a rare instance. Um, it took me a lot. It takes. It took me a lot to kind of make that switch from I believe in Farhan to I don't. I mean, Chassie, I was... Out of town that week, up at my at my grandparents' place in uh, in Inverness that week, basically sitting on a dock on Tamales Bay all week long, thinking, "Is is this it? Is Farhan not the guy?" Like I'm on vacation, you know, waffling in my head where we're at with Farhan Zaidi. That's just how how down bad I was last summer. Um, but here's the thing: while I'm not quite ready to jump headfirst back onto the Farhan bandwagon just yet, because there's still one tiny big thing I need to see. Yes, he's made a lot of big moves this offseason. He signed a lot of free agents. But really, any general manager, president of baseball operations can sign free agents. I mean, if I wanted someone who was really good at signing free agents, then I would have just kept Brian Sabian and, and never shown him the door. Because Sabian, you know, great at signing free agents. I mean, it helped you add Barry Bonds to kind of use to recruit. But that was Sabian's thing. He was great at bringing free agents in. What I saw in Farhan Zaidi that was different from Sabian that I still want to see is what you can do with the farm system. Um, Brian Sabian, he had that great run, you know, from Posey to Panic, of, or Matt Cain as well, of great draft picks. Tim wants to come in there as well. Madison Baumgartner, Crawford, uh, Belt. Um, but for the most part, Brian Sabian's draft history, his, his history with the farm system, it did leave a lot to be desired. Part of the reason why the Giants were in the mess that they were in when, you know, Farhan Zaidi came to town was because... After the Joe Panic pick, 
the Giants farm system just went off a cliff. Um, and when I see with Farhan Zaidi and the work he did with the Dodgers, now we can debate till the cows come home how, you know, involved he was in the construction of the Dodgers farm system. But the fact of the matter is, like, George W. Bush was the president the last time the Dodgers did not have a top 10 farm system. The Dodgers have had elite young talent for a long time, and Farhan Zaidi helped cultivate that from 2014 onwards. When Farhan came here, I saw this as a guy who knows how to build a sustainable farm system to keep cranking out great baseball players in perpetuity. We just haven't quite seen that just yet. Um, you know, you you bring up the Hunter Bishop pick a lot. That was the first draft pick this uh, regime made, and you know, Matos into legitimate baseball players. Who knows what will happen this year uh, in regards to that? But for Farhan Zaidi, for him to really show me that the Farhan that we've been so frustrated with the last few years is gone, I need to see more talent coming out of this farm system. I think the Giants are still in the bottom third of baseball right now in terms of their no, farm system. No, I would system. agree. But but I think to your point on like Matos and Luciano, let's not forget that like Elliot Ramos at one point was a highly coveted prospect. Mm-hmm. Joey Bart, who's still on the team, was a highly a coveted great prospect. Too. He's in four well, let me get it up here. He's in four twenty three so far this spring. Good. I want to see him play. Yeah. You know, I I, I, I don't want to see Tom Murphy. I want to see Joey Bart make this team. Why not? You know, mm-hmm. mix him in at first base. Like, let's do it. But uh, there have been five mega trades. Mega trades. And you have to have the prospects to be able to deal them. Think about Sabian. You're bringing all, all these signs. He did a great job making trades. Yeah. Melky was a trade. Pagan, Pagan was a trade. Scudero was a trade. Uh, Hunter Pence was a trade. You know, um, all these guys. Trade, 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 trade. Lo- Javi Lopez acquired via a trade. Yeah. They did a great job. Hey, Tommy Joseph, you're no longer in our cards. We're yeah. trading you away. You know? Hey, Zach Wheeler, we're not going to pick you. Tim Alderson, we're not going to keep you. You're getting traded away. What frustrated me is that you were never in on Francisco Lindor because you didn't have the prospects. You were never in on Matt Olson because you didn't have the prospects. You weren't in on Mookie Betts because you didn't have the prospects. You weren't in on Machado or any of these other guys that have been dealt at the deadline because you didn't have those prospects. Trey Turner, will they be willing to be in the mix this year in July? Do they have the prospects? Do they have the cupboard to go star hunting? Because we know guys will be available. Juan Soto was available. Different guys will be available. Will they have the cupboard stocked to be able to have guys outside of Luciano, outside of Matos, to make a big move like that? Because that's going to be the other side of the coin there. And you're absolutely right, Shasky, as uh, we get deeper into this season. When the trade deadline comes around, this team's in contention. We saw it last year. The Giants, they were kind of like... They weren't going to win the division, but they were in with it. They were in the thick of the playoff race at the end of July last year, and I'll always remember, you know, sitting in the in that little office in the in the uh, press box when Farhan's given his uh, end of the first half presser, saying, "Yeah, we really like our starting pitching right now. We're not going to make any moves there." And I had to stifle <laughs> a, an audible gasp there because it's like, "There's no way you're saying that." But going in the trade deadline this year, you need to be able to make moves to improve yes. this team. Uh, wherever those improvements are going to be needed, and you need a good farm system in order to do that. So I need to see Far- Farhan churn out a more consistent farm system with more you know, great players in it because I don't want to see a series of just one-off teams. Yes. You know, like 2021, that was a one-off team. I don't want to see the 2024 Giants be a one-off team. I want to see the 2024 Giants be the start of of a long reign of success that eventually, you know, blows up the Dodgers Death Star with two proton torpedoes down the exhaust vent. And then all of a sudden the Giants are now the new kings of the NL West. Got to get those Star Wars references in there. We are up against it. Uh, just want to remind everyone, this is the Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys live show. Uh, we're usually a podcast, but today we're on air previewing the 2024 Giants season. If you like what you're hearing it's from Sam Lubman and Joe Shasky, that's us. Uh, then make sure you're subscribing to the Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Spotify, subscribe, share, rate, review, uh, call your mom up, make sure she's subscribed. My mom's listening right now. Hey, mom, how you doing? Um, when we come back, we're going to get into Bob Melvin a bit. And again, more Farhan Zaidi. Are we cool to flip our opinion on him now? Are we in on Farhan? What more do you need to see from Farhan if you're not all the way there yet? Adam in the city, I see you. We're going to get you on the other side as well. It's Sam Lumman. It's Joe Shasky. It's Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys here on 95.7 The Game.
You're listening to Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys on 95.7 The Game. It is Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys here on 95.7 The Game. Sam Lubman here with Joe Shasky. And uh, we got a special guest, guest on the line, Shasky. One of the OG Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys hosts. You can catch him every day on 95.7 The Game between 2 and 6 o'clock along with his host, co-host Dan Dibley. It is the great homegrown Mark Willard. Mark, welcome back on to Garlic Fries and Baseball, guys. Man, how are you doing, man? What a, what a formal intro, Sam. I, yeah, I remember when I was there to call myself a Garlic Fry and Baseball guy. I miss those days. Oh, once a Garlic Fry and Baseball guy, always a Garlic Fry and Baseball guy. That's why we had to get you on today. I ran into you to the hallway on, on Wednesday as we were uh, avoiding the all-staff meeting. I said, hey, Mark, you know, we're... Doing a live show this Sunday, man. You're you're an OG garlic fried baseball guy. You got to call in, and and here we are. And here we are. And I would much rather act like we're planning something productive in the other room than listen to an all staff meeting. So I'm glad. You're always doing productive that, uh, stuff. That it, that, yeah, I'm glad that I'm glad that it led to this moment, and and I'm glad that excitement about this season is like not something that you have to hide anymore. I feel like the last couple of years. You weren't allowed to have the opinion that I think some of us now have. Absolutely. And let's start off with the excitement factor there. Just right off the bat, what is the thing that has you most excited for the 2024 San Francisco Giants baseball season? A different brand of baseball. Um, A more traditional brand of baseball. A brand that's going to allow the players to not end up feeling like they are either disenfranchised or that they've been lied to or what have you. You know, I just, I, I, I don't think that that, uh, obviously two years ago it led to a really, really good season, or you could say it as, you know, things just kind of all landed in place that year. But for me, since then, too many players have felt like they were offered one role and then another one developed, and that's part of life and part of sports for sure, but but not at the level that, that, that has been going on with the Giants. And so the fact that they've turned things over to uh, a manager that's more successful, more traditional, and obviously has the cachet to the point where some free agents are now choosing to come here, that's, that, that's to me is what, what I'm most interested in right now. So, Mark, uh, if I make you pick a player, who's the guy that you are the most excited to see as a Giants fan every single day? You know, I mean, first of all, what's up, Joe? How are we doing, hey, my buddy. boy? I, I, like, yeah, I, you know, the first name that comes to mind is probably not quite what you're asking. I, it, it's Kyle Harrison. Um, mm-hmm. I, I really want to see what this guy can do because, uh, the people I'm talking to that are close to this thing on the daily are, are convinced that stardom is in his future. Um, however, I will also say, if you meant that, because you said every day, if you meant a position player, I don't know how we could not be fascinated to see what Jung Hoo Lee is going to be as a big leaguer. And just the, in the little that we've gotten to know him, the personality that, that he shows, and, uh, and the way that he can kind of potentially get things started and, and be a table setter for the actual middle of the order that they now kind of sort of have. Um, so if you met an everyday player, that's, that's what I'd say. But, but if pitchers are on the table, I, I, I think Kyle Harrison could really break out this year. I mean, we're talking about kind of these, these young guys who are getting us exciting here. Uh, yesterday, Mark, I don't know if you caught any of that game on TV, but while John Miller was having a conversation with Jung Hoo Lee, Marco Luciano yep. completely upstaged the conversation by hitting an absolute tater off his own image on the scoreboard out in left field. Where are you at with Marco Luciano? He's been very up and down in terms of not just with the bat, but also with his health. He had a little cup of coffee last year. Um, what are your expectations for Luciano? And I guess the big question, when you know opening day is going to be this Thursday, what sideline is Marco Luciano standing on? Is he standing on the, the Giants' sideline in San Diego, or is he standing on a sideline somewhere else, wherever the River Cats are playing? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I sort of I, I have to admit that my excitement level for him has been tamped down just because I'm sort of letting the organization lead. Um, and, and I'm not saying that they're out on him by any stretch, but they've clearly hit the brakes 
on what they think he's ready to do. And I, the bottom line is, is I don't think he's a shortstop. I'm excited about his bat, but I don't think he's a shortstop. So they sort of need to go through this recalibration process of, of what he's ready to be, what position can he handle, what position is open right now with the Giants, that kind of thing. Um, I mean, to have the excitement around that guy turn into – Let's just get like a reliable veteran in Nick Ahmed. I, it, it's, it's hard to have the same excitement level. Like we've been hearing about this guy for four years and, uh, and, and we're still not there. So I don't think they're done with him. I'm certainly not done with him. I really want to see the guy play, but, but somehow, some way, I think they're still trying to figure out exactly who he is. Now, when you look at the team, clearly the roster is significantly better. Like, I just go across the board. You know, they've upgraded center field. They've upgraded third base. you got a full season of Patrick Bailey. Estrada hopefully will have a full season. Who knows about shortstop? But the production from shortstop was not good last year. Like, we all love Brandon Crawford. It wasn't great, and he was hurt a lot, and Estrada had to go over there. I hope we get the corner outfielders, you know, to be healthy this year. Uh, but it feels like they've upgraded at DH. Have they upgraded at manager? Because that's a question we were kicking around, and it's hard to quantify. What's your feel on that? I think so right now, just because from what I've heard, and, and you know, I know when we think about we think about X's and O's and decision-making, and that can always go one way or the other. Gabe Kapler was the manager of the year two years ago, so it's not like, it's not like he's a dummy and doesn't know what to do out on the field. But it was so robotic, and, it, and, and the opposite of what Bochy was before him, and, and – and, and just did not have, I think, the finger on the pulse of the actual players. He had the finger on the pulse of his fan. And, and that sort of, at a certain point, it, I think, as I said earlier, it sort of made some of the players feel a little disenfranchised, uh, a little inhuman, if you will. Uh, but Bob Melvin's decisions aren't all going to be perfect either. But I, So it's not for me so much about X's and O's. It's about the clubhouse and from from what I gather the players are really into it the players are really excited you've had two free agents who have joined probably almost because of him and so uh, that credibility along with the former giant angle bringing back Matty Williams Pat Burrell that whole thing I think can help this front office which has a hard time getting in touch with its fans it, it's going to help them do that so um, I, I, to me, the answer is yes, Joe. I, I, I think they have. You mentioned, you know, the, the this front office kind of getting reconnected with the fans here. Um, you know, Mark, you you've been a a one of the bigger champions of Farhan Zaidi. You and I, we were kind of fighting off the battle on fighting the battle on our own for for quite a while there before I jumped off the ship. But uh, you asked the question the other day. You know, let's why can't we let, allow ourselves to like Farhan again? I'm kind of curious, just. Where do you th see things at with Farhan Zaidi and, and the Giants and this fan base? And yeah, is it are we at a position where it's just like, all right, Farhan, we're we're trusting you again, or is there still some room for you know what? I th this process is really good, but let's see the results first before we start crowning anybody. You know, the great uh, GM of the future. Yeah, no, I think there are plenty of questions left, but for me, the off season that he just had sort of answered those. Uh, those things that, that, that people have always said about him. He's not cheap. He's not the one in charge of the money anyway. He's, um, you know, the whole risk-averse thing, you could still make that case. I mean, we'll see how, if this works out. You've got some good players, but they're, a lot of them are on one-year deals. And, and so th this may not be great on term. I don't know. But he definitely had a great offseason, answered a lot of questions to where now the pressure is more in the clubhouse. It's more on the players and the manager to perform because I think he's given the organization everything that you could hope for. But I go back to the statement that led you to that question. I just think that this organization, and he is a big part of this, has a hard time connecting with fans on a human level and, and making them feel like this is fun making them feel connected to their past. I think he's made some bad decisions behind the scenes that some fans don't even know about, but they can feel them. They, like, they've wanted to disconnect from their past. And I think that's because Farhan wanted to do it a new way and prove that it was their way. But that's a bad idea, especially since we're so recent 
from some really, really great moments and great years. So to me, that's still something that he needs to work on and, and something to prove. But as far as like the roster construction, he had a pretty good offseason. 25th year at AT&T Park. I mean, it's kind of crazy. I, I mean, geez, man. I mean, it's, it's, it's wild that we've actually hit the 25th season over there. Um, and there's just something. I know, Mark, you're raising your family to be Giants fans, and you've got great memories with them. And Sam's dad called in today, and, you know, I'm taking my little guy to his first ever Giants game opening day next week. And I remember when my dad took me to a game, and this is my earliest Giants memory, 1985, Chris Brown hitting a home run into the family pavilion on a Wednesday day game, and I went underneath the pullout stands, grabbed the ball, came running up, got, got you know, a standing ovation from everybody in the stands. What's your earliest or favorite, your choice, earliest or favorite Giants memory? Well, the first thing that comes to mind, and I love hearing this question from you, bud, because what what you've uh, what you've been going through in your world over the last four or five months um, with your pops and now your son, uh, I know it's emotional and difficult, but it's also beautiful in uh, in a lot of ways. So um, you know, we those of us who grew up doing this since since, uh, since we could walk, it's always a fun kind of thing to think about. I had a buddy named Russ who had a birthday party. I don't know who knew who. Somebody must have known somebody. They had a birthday party in like a parking lot at Candlestick Park that was kind of up against the back center field wall of the stadium. And we're in the middle of the birthday party. We just think we're going there, probably having a piece of cake and going to a ball game. And then all of a sudden, the, the, the like a, what looked like a garage door lifts from center field in Candlestick Park. And Bob Brenly and Mike Kruko in wow. uniform walk out. And they just walk into the birthday party. And I'll never forget my buddy Russ and his, like, his reaction. He was just like, holy moly. <laughs> and, like, it, yeah, like, here's these two guys, like, like literal giants, walking into this birthday party. We were probably, I don't know, seven years old, something like that. These guys were our heroes. Wow. And they sat there and signed autographs and hung out for whatever it was five to ten minutes, turned around, went back in, and we went to the ball game. I don't remember who won that day, but that's like that's one of the first things that kind of pops out. Sounds I like, love that. Sounds like you won before the game, if anything. <laughs> yes, seriously. No doubt. No, doubt. no doubt. Yeah, good day. I still don't know how the hell that happened. You know, like when you're a kid, you're just like, cool, they came to the birthday <laughs> party. Like, I don't know who the hell knew who that made that happen, you know? I love it. That's, that's, that's awesome there. It. So, um, you know, again, we're, we're talking about what's getting us excited here, and obviously, down in uh, in LA, things are not as exciting uh-huh. right now. I'm this isn't. I'm not setting up a show. Hey, question. I'm not doing that quite yet. But just looking at the Dodgers right now, looking at the Giants right now, you know, I, I call the the Dodgers a Death Star. You know, they are gonna never be bad ever again. They're gonna own the National League West for all of perpetuity. Um, Mark, I'm curious, just with the team the Giants have right now. How how much I think they finished like what twenty three games behind the Dodgers last year in the division. How much are they eating into that gap this year? How close can the Giants get to the Dodgers in the NL West? Or why not, Mark? Do you do you see a path where the Giants can possibly unseat the mighty Dodgers for the second time in the last eleven years? Well, I don't I don't see a path in terms of like I could sit here and tell you why. But the only reason I see a pop is because it's baseball. So I, I know that it's possible because, like, I'm with FP. We had three shows this week, and he was firmly like, dude, the, the Dodgers don't get the division just because they, they, they show up. Like it's, and, and you never know what can happen. And, my God, if the first three days of, of the season aren't evidence of that, I, I don't know what it is. So. Um, I'm not saying it's even necessarily the Giants, but I'm not like the Dodgers have already won the division. I don't feel that way at all. This is a really hard division. It's got four really solid, at least, teams. And, um, you know, I definitely see the Giants, as you say, eating into this. Like, I do think they're a playoff team. They can be. Um, and, uh, and as far as whether or not it's the Dodgers division or do I see a possibility of any, any team not named the Rockies, winning the division. I see that as absolutely possible. So you got to let the journey unfold and see who gets hurt, who overperforms, 
who has things bounced their way a little bit. And, uh, and I definitely think all four of these teams are going to have, uh, uh, if things fall their way and, they, and they're blessed with health, like they're going to have an opportunity for a special season. All right, last one, Mark, before you get on out of here. You're, you got a magic yep, yep. wand, and you're allowed to bestow power on one person on the team. It can't be one of the youngsters. No Bailey, no Matos, no Luciano, no Harrison. Who's the guy you're bestowing a career year upon? Uh, Michael Conforto. Wow. Uh, my, uh, absolutely. Michael Conforto is the name that I'm going to bring up because, like, I wanted to say Soler, but I, I, I feel like he can just, if he does even anything close to what he did last year, that, and, and that's kind of, sort of a different answer because he's DH and yeah. and, um, and his, his analytics are, are kind of like whatever. He's going to strike out a lot. But if he gives us swag and power, we're like, cool, we're into it. But Michael Conforto is a really good baseball player who I feel like Giants fans did not get to see. I don't, I don't think he was healthy for much of the year last year. I think he was definitely at times a victim of the Kapler system, if you will. Um, if, if the Giants get, uh, you know, that's somebody who can hit 25 to 30 home runs. Mm. And if they get that at the, uh, at the corner outfield position and it's not Chapman and it's not Soler, if they get that from someone else, um, then, then that's the kind of thing that I think turns this lineup in, from an interesting one into a really good one. Awesome. Well, uh, we're all excited for this season, and it's, it's just wild to think where we were on this team just a, a few weeks ago compared to where we are now. Um, with the Warriors season coming to its kind of dismal end, the Giants uh, coming out of nowhere to pick us up and be like, hey, don't worry, we got you. You'll, we'll, you'll, we'll, we'll keep you very entertained. Just a very wild uh, string of events here for the Giants. Mark, really appreciate you uh, calling in and uh, joining us on the show today. Dudes, I love that you're doing this, and I'm I'm just pumped that I get to drive around for the next hour and keep listening to you guys talk about the Giants. So let's, let's go, uh, baby. Let's roll. Oh, yeah. Let's go, baby. All right, Mark Willard. You can Thanks, hear him Mark. on Willard and Dibs every day, 2-6. to six. Uh, There's lobby a lot more Giants talk you'll see from him this year as well. A uh, lot to take away from that there. Um, but first, uh, I do want to kind of stay on the lines here because uh, we got Adam in the city. He's been waiting on hold for a while. Before we go to Adam, though, what do you got, Chasky? Yeah, just real quickly, I do want to hear from people. You, you're not allowed to take one of the youngsters. Mm -hmm. Who's the guy that is I the like litmus test for you? You're, you got the magic wand. You can give that. You know, when if a team wants to have a great year, somebody or a couple of guys have to have career years. Who's the guy you're going bang and you're hitting the wand on them and bestowing a career year upon them? And if you guys like what you're listening to, remember, hit subscribe. You can find us. This is Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys podcast. Wherever you get your podcast, most people get it on Apple, iTunes, but we'll also be on 95.7 The Game's YouTube page. And Spotify. Um, Giants content. All year long, like a 30 to 45 minute morsel, very mm -hmm. straightforward. You can listen to it while you're working out or whatever it is. We know you listen to 95.7 The Game, and we appreciate that. But if you just want Giants content, Sammy and I, we bring it to you multiple times a week. Garlic Fries and Baseball, guys. Giants dedicated podcast. Definitely, yes. Let Be sure to like, subscribe, rate, share, review. Tell everybody else about it. Um, we are going to go back out to the lines, though. 888-957-9570. We do want to hear from all the Giants fans out there today. What's got you excited? Who's the guy that you want to wave the magic wand and bestow a career year on? Uh, where are you at on Farhan Zaidi? What does Bob Melvin do for you? Jung Hu Lee, Matt Chapman. There's so many guys to be excited about right now. Um, and I know Adam in the city, he's one of the most excited Giants fans out there. Adam, thanks for calling into the show, man. What has you excited for the Giants right now? Um, well, thanks for having me on, guys. It's uh, nice to listen to you guys on the weekends. I, uh, mm -hmm. I know this is like a, you know, oddball day to have it on a Sunday, but like, I kind of enjoying this. Hopefully you guys can do it some more this season. Um, oh, we'll see. I mean, it's just the fact that we have players that I want to show up to the ballpark and watch like last year. You know, it was talked about so much. Like, I don't, I don't, not that I don't know anyone on the team, but I'm like, I don't want to buy a jersey on anyone on the team because, like, I don't know if they're going to be here. Like, there wasn't really any excitement. Now there's excitement. Like, I, I'm excited about this team that has been put together. Got to get, and I've been a, and Sam, you know this, that I've been a huge Farhan critic and borderline beyond pissed off with him for years, but. He had a really good off season. Let's see if it translates to the field. But I, 
I, like Solaire, Chapman, Young, who like all these guys. It's like I'm I'm excited. Um, to answer your question, who would I bestow a, uh, a wand on to have a career year? How about you, Stremski? How about we get a mm-hmm. healthy year from him? Because when he is healthy and he is seeing the ball well, he's a very good baseball player. Unfortunately, over the years, he's always just like he always gets hot and then he gets hurt. So. How about we just wave a wand to have have him have a career year, but have him be healthy too? I agree. Yeah, that would be a great one to have there. Adam, thanks for calling it's in, interesting. Man. It's interesting people are going with the two corner outfielders uh, early on in Yaz and Conforto. Um, man, it, it does feel like if one of them doesn't, or both, don't perform, Matos is waiting in the wings to take the mm-hmm. spot. I mean, Matos, he might be kind of in the wings right now, as I mentioned a little earlier. You know, Austin Slater, he's he's still dealing with issues from that uh, surgically reconstructed elbow. Um, I mean, I'm not sure how that's going to be. I don't know if he can still swing a bat at all, but he clearly can't play the field right yeah. now. Um, that could open things up for for Luis Matos to squeeze onto the opening day roster if, if Austin Slater does go uh, or does start the season on the IL. And then at that point, you know, can Matos play well enough to where he doesn't, re- there's really no room for Austin well, Slater uh, on the roster, but... That's a, that's a good point there. Another name I think we'd like to see a career year from, and you kind of saw it uh, for, a, at the, for a time at the beginning of last year, it's Jairo Estrada. Um, okay. he, was, he was on an all-star trajectory last okay. year uh, until I think it was a thumb injury that kind of just really derailed the rest of his season there. Um, because, I mean, the Giants, the Giants really, I, we talk about kind of missed opportunities in the past, and I know we're up against it, and we'll we get into this on the other side, but uh, the 2021 offseason was one of the biggest missed opportunities I think the Giants have ever had, maybe in franchise history in terms of taking a chance to upgrade the team uh, during free agency. You come off a 107-win season, and you knew you needed help in the middle. I know Crawford just had a great year. Uh, you had Estrada coming up, but you knew you still needed help in that middle of the infield, and Corey Seager and Marcus Simeon were both available, and the Giants didn't even get involved in either one of those guys. And... Either one of those guys would have been a massive help to this team last year. Um, the Giants missed out on that. And uh, and I know, believe Francisco Lindor got traded in that same that's offseason. True. But part of the reason why they skipped out on those two is because, well, we got Tyro Estrada. And I Tyro know. is a great player, but he's not in the level of Corey Seager and Marcus Simeon. So no. I need to see Tyro make it to that next level this year and have that career year. So um, if you're liking what you're hearing against the Garlic Fries and Baseball guys, be sure to like, rate, review, subscribe, all of it on iTunes and Spotify. Really quick, I want to give a shout out to Sterling Bennett, who's uh, behind the glass on the on the board, pressing all the buttons and knobs. Coming in a little bit early uh, before tonight's Warrior game to help us out here and keep us on the air and answer the phone. So thank you very much, Sterling, for doing that. Um, we got about an hour left here. We're talking about what's making us excited for this season. I want to talk a little bit about Bob Melvin. And uh, Shasky, I want to... Uh, Hold the Giants roster up, uh, compare it to the rest of the National League West, Dodgers, Padres, um, Diamondbacks, not not the Rockies. And I just want to see just how these teams stand up apples to apples, position by position, uh, all the way from top to bottom. So we'll do that on the other side. Sam Lubman, Joe Shasky, Sterling Bennett behind the glass, Garlic Fries and Baseball guys all here on 95.7 The Game.
Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys on 95.7 The Game. Thanks, Dave. Appreciate you doing that uh, Garlic Fries intro for us. It is Sam Lubman. It is Joe Shasky. It is Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys. Usually we're a podcast, but today we are a live show here on 95.7 The Game as we preview the San Francisco Giants upcoming 2024 season. If you like what you're hearing today, make sure you're liking and subscribing to the podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Uh, subscribe to the podcast, share the podcast, review the podcast, and then share the podcast again. Uh, tell everyone you've ever met. Remember that third grade uh, teacher you had? Call them up and say, hey, listen to this Giants podcast, and they'll be very confused as to why you're calling them. Um, I'm watching Joe Shasky. Is he eating some garlic fries right now? Dude, you are uh, you are pounding your lunch right now. I mean, you know, I've been waiting for this sandwich for quite some time. Ooh. You know, it's nothing like an anticipated sandwich. Oh, it's delicious. Shout out Ike's. Oh, love it. Which, uh, which Ike's sandwich did you get? Uh, Danny Darko? Danny Turco? I don't even know. Hmm. Okay, the Donny Darko? I don't, e- <laughs> I don't even know what that is. I was always so the, the, you see how you know I'm a Giants fan? The two sandwiches I always got all the time when I would go to Ike's, the Matt, Matt Cain. Cain. That Godfather sauce hits so well. Which, yeah. first off, that's such a great name for a sauce. Like, I never thought I'd ever be sitting here saying that's a great name for a sauce, but Godfather sauce is such a great name, especially for a sandwich named after Matt Cain, like the Godfather of Giants Perfect Games. Um, that in the the Tim Lincecum that always hit well too because they always just they loaded that bad boy up uh, with avocado and that made it so good. Um, you're talking sandwiches, Shasky. You're talking food right now and talking garlic fries. Um, we're going to be back at the ballpark in uh, less than two weeks now. You're going to be at opening day. I intend to be at opening day. My dad's going to be at opening day. I'm curious, Shasky, when you get back to the ballpark, what's the mm-hmm. first concession stand that you're trying to get to right now? Well, I mean, you know me. Vontae's somewhere driving around right now, and I guarantee you he's smiling. I got to go into the brand new refurbished Giants dugout store. So when you go to it, I walked by yesterday and my wife I didn't know they refurbished me it. from the entrance to come out. They <laughs> reconfigured the whole thing. And oh, now really? they have this whole like, you know how Safeway has this um, self-checkout line, if you yeah. will? <clears throat> the new Giants dugout store has its own self-checkout area. I don't know. Like I didn't go inside. Interesting. The whole thing is reconfigured. There's a ton of new merch. I'm really excited to get in there and go there first. I'm not going to lie to you. I'm a sucker for the merch. Mm-hmm. No, I, I'll, I'll probably be a sucker for the merch. I mean, I, I'm, I am a sucker for the merch. I mean, I buy new stuff, you know, at least once a homestand. You guys always see me when I come in wearing it. You know, I love that. Yeah, but you um, get good use out of it, and it, oh, it makes yeah. great gear. I mean, th- there wasn't a Christmas that didn't go by during the 2010 through 2020, 2020 where you didn't get everybody, uh, mm-hmm. somebody in your family, some new Giants gear. I'll be loading up on new giant socks this year. I got a bunch of the City Connect socks last year. I know I know you and I are split on the City Connects. I'm out. I know. Well, I think the- they're going to wear the uh, Giants, what I call the hum baby, you know, uh, 1980s Giants oh, really? attitude era. I think that they're going to wear them this year. That's what I heard from a little birdie. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, no, I, I do like those uniforms. Um, Yeah, those City Connects. I never liked the jerseys on the City Connects, but the hat, the socks, I- the out. T-shirts. The the it's not key even the lanyard right shade of orange. It's it's, it's, it's kind of the right shade. Orange. It's it's more Miami Hurricane orange, if you ask me. But uh, you know, we were talking uh, concession stands there. Obviously, you know, I'm always at the garlic fry stand. Shasky, um, last year my little project that I did uh, just for fun was I tried a bunch of the different concession stands and, and kind of rated them to see what had the best Cha-cha concession the item. Hook. The Cha Cha Bowl was up there. It was not my number one, though. What was your number? My one? number one, and this was an upset even to me. And I was the guy conducting well, time this out, test. Time out. Let me ask you this before you continue, and we're going to get back into the Giants themselves. Mm-hmm. Does time of day factor into the to the cuisine? Because there are there is a time and a place for certain food throughout the day. Day game is different from night game. That is true, and honestly, I I did not even consider that. No, okay. I just went and it's okay. just like you know what, this is what I'm going to try and eat today. Um, you know, whether it was daytime, nighttime, I, that did not factor into it. But that's a good point. Maybe if I uh, if I decide to go down that rabbit hole again, I'll factor that in. But I had the Cha Cha Bowl coming in at number four. Okay, uh, so give me on your these top rankings. five. So the no, top five rankings are uh, maybe we can number five. Yeah, bring up the numbers really quick. Here we go. Number five. There we go. Uh, so number five on the list was a new item last year. It was the Crazy Crab Waffle Fries. Hadn't tried that. Okay. Those are really good. The only way they could be a little bit better is if the waffle fries were garlic waffle fries. But you know what? I'm splitting hairs there. 
took one bite. I'm like, all right, yeah, we're we're on board with this. Okay. This is this is the greatest thing ever. Uh, a little pricey, but definitely worth it. Number four is the Cha Cha Bowl. Um, Excellent. Been Center having field. that for a long time. Yeah, Orlando's so Barbecue, good. love them. So I get a little good. bit of the Chipotle sauce on top of it. Ooh, it, I'll, oh, I'll it, try that next it time. It hits very hard. Yeah. Um, number three, you can get that the exact same. Well, first off, number four. Number four. All right, and now number three. Number three. Uh, it was, you can get it at that same stand. It's Orlando's Chicken Nachos. Um, those were incredibly good. Really? Oh, yeah. They're very cheesy. You're definitely going to want a fork to eat them. Okay. Um, but those hit really hard. Now it's full the rest of the game, too, which that was a big thing for me when determining, you know, these rankings was not just what tastes good, but also factoring in price. Yes. But also factoring in how satisfied does this meal leave you? Like, okay. am I hungry a little a few innings later? All or right. is, you know, Camilo Doval walking in and I'm like, wow, I'm still full. This is crazy. Anyway, yeah. let's get this saved. Um, so moving on to number two. Did you try the lumpia two. stand? The lumpia stand, I did try to not crack my top five, though. Okay, because my um, wife likes them. Okay, keep going. No, the lumpia was good, but unfortunately but it was it's forced only out available of the top five. right near home plate, so mm -hmm. it's tough because if you're sitting in other sections. Yeah. But keep going. No, it works for me because it's right behind the press box, so yeah. it, it's right there. No, I do like the lumpia a lot, and they give you a lot, too. They do. Number two was uh, the Grand Slam brisket sliders Ooh. with mac and cheese and coleslaw. Ooh. You could find this behind section 110, I believe. Okay. Um, it's the Brothers Barbecue cart. It's oh, kind of yeah. tucked in there, but I went and I got it, and I, I brought it into the press box, and uh, John Dickinson, back when he was with 95.7 at the time, he was there too. He took one look. He's like, what is that? I got to <laughs> get that. He immediately bolts out to go get it himself, and that's how you know when, when you eat something, we're just like, oh, I need to get some of that. I need, I'm going to jump on that. You know it's good. Okay, and your number one? It, it was a loaded thing. Number one, again, this was an upset even to me. Like, I'm eating this. I'm like, there's okay. no way I'm about to put this yeah. number one. Go out to center field in the in the, in the edible garden um, mm -hmm. behind the 391 marker. Ghirardelli Sunday. No. The gluten-free flatbread pizza. What? I Not know. Tony's? I know. Of all the places. Like, I, when I had this pizza, I, had, I, I went out with a friend of mine. Um, he got one with like mushrooms on it. I got a sausage pepperoni one. So we kind of switched slices a little bit to okay. get more of a palate. And I'm eating this. I'm like, this is the best thing I've eaten at the ballpark all year. I, I, I was shocked. Wow. Like the cha-cha bowl. Love it. The gar and I, 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 the garlic fries, by the way, were unranked. They kind of transcend of these course, rankings. Of course. Um, but no, I'm eating this gluten free, gluten free flatbread pizza. And I'm just sitting there like, I'm literally about to name this the best concession item wow. at this ballpark. And like, I'm shocked that I'm in this position. What? So definitely recommend it. But again, there's, there's, you, you really can't go wrong with, uh, with any food at the ballpark unless it's the crazy crap sandwich. Who was the best player on the Giants last year? Because you're best, listing your, your best food at the ballpark last year. Who was the best player on the Giants last year? Uh, among position players? Because if it's just, just best player, just don't even, don't overthink it. Oh, it's this. Logan Webb. Logan Webb was, if you're looking at like MLB, the show always puts like, you know, yeah. the best player on the team, yeah. you know, that's your 99 player. It was Logan Webb. Okay. Okay. Who was number two? Number two is probably Camilo Doval. All right. And who's number your number two? Three? Number three last year. Number three. I'm having too much fun with this. Number three last year was probably I would have to give that to looking up another line. My God, was it God, was it JD Davis or Tyro Strong? Wilmer? Was it, Wilmer was floor. Well, we haven't mentioned Wilmer at all yet in well, this I, show. And, and that's where um, I want to go with this. So yeah, you I'll said Logan Wilmer, Webb, Camilo Duval, Wilmer Flores. Yeah. If I told you none of those three were the top three players this year, wouldn't that tell you the Giants had a monster season? Either a monster season or something absolutely catastrophic happened. My Wilmer guess is Flores be cannot be your number. I love Wilmer. Wilmer cannot you if, if they want to go to the playoffs, he cannot be a top three player on this team this year. And I love Wilmer Flores. I, I do. I really do. I think him at first base uh, in a platoon situation, maybe an occasional DH to give Soler a, a, a day off or whatever. Like I'm, I'm, I'm here for that. But your closer getting fifty or sixty appearances and a guy who's making thirty starts, like. That's not even half the games. You know, mm -hmm. I need somebody who plays every single day to be the number one and number two players on this team. Like yeah. that, that is why they went out and made the move to go get Matt Chapman and Jung Hoo Lee. And this is why they brought in Jorge Soler. Like, yeah. I, I need one of these other guys to step up and be one of the top two or three players on this team. Absolutely. I think you're going to have, I mean, I would not be su surprised if your top three guys you're among hitters this year, it's going to be a combination of Soler, Lee, and Chapman. Um, and that's, that's exactly what you should be rooting for. Jung Hoo Lee, I think if Jung Hoo Lee could be the best player on this team this year, I would be ecstatic because I just 
I am so excited to what we're going to see from him this year. Um, because I think he is just so perfectly built for this ballpark. He has the exact Why do you say kind of, that? because the he's not a power hitter, Chasky. I think a lot of people kind of wanted the Giants to bring some, you know, big name power into this team. And I do think Horse Jorge Soler does bring that power. Maybe not on like that, you know, big time level that maybe we we think right off the bat. But Lucy uh, uh Jung Hu Lee, he is a big gap to gap hitter. He is going to he is going to live in that right center and left center uh, field gaps this year. And with how much space is out there, I mean, Shasky, we were talking earlier on the show, what's the recipe to success in this ballpark? It's pitching, it's defense, which Jung Huli, he'll help with the defense a little bit. Mm -hmm. But the other, the third part of that, it's that gap to gap hitting, that station to station offense, moving guys along the ground attack, as we like to call it. Um, so, by the way, we got a very special guest joining us in a couple minutes. Oh, nice. Um, so if I said that he did this this year, Jung Huli, 15 triples, eight home runs, 56 RBIs, 29 stolen bases, almost 50 walks, struck out under 100 times, and batted 288. Would that be good? Would that be what you're looking for? Would that be not good enough? Because you know what that is? That's the 2012 season of Angel Pagan. Mm -hmm. Now, you might not be able to get the amount of triples because of how they reconfigured the outfield wall, but if I told you this guy batted 288 and struck out under 100 times, played elite defense, and gave me the same kind of energy that they got from Angel Pagan, wouldn't you take that? That is a that is a win and a half. Shasky, I mean, you talk about uh, Angel Pagan's line. Um I mean, whatever his stats said... He was a spark plug. He was a spark plug. The difference of him in the lineup versus out of the lineup Absolutely. was not... Like, I always read the the, uh, the Angel Pagan uh, inside the park home run. One of the most electrifying moments in at and Park history. They turn it into a bobblehead. That yeah. moment has a dark connotation for me because that's where he kind of injured his hamstring that year. Tor and it, yeah. and it, it neutered him for the rest of the 2013 totally season. It completely crippled the Giants season. Um, Shasky, you know who's really great to have in the lineup, though? It's Daryl the Guru Johnson. What? And he's calling in on Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys. Goo, how are we doing today, buddy? What's up, Goo? Hey, what's up, baby? Y'all killing it. I went and watched Bob Marley for the eighth time. It was just me and my son because it felt nice. like a concert. I love me some baseball. And real quick, we had a show meeting, Steiny I and Evan and the boss. And the boss, he didn't put oh, a oh, jacket oh. on me about what sport I like because I like them all just like kids. But I was like, I love baseball, and that's why I'm tuning in to you guys. Awesome. I love it. Baby. <laughs> hey, Goo, I want to start right here. Like, you and I were watching every single night because we're addicted to this. And I'm watching your Pittsburgh Pirates at 4 o'clock on the East Coast, and I'm, I'm texting excited. you about, you know, all, all kinds of guys. O'Neill Cruz being the, the, the number one, but... It was very difficult to tap into the Giants in September, in August, when the lineup was just so boring. Who's the guy that you were the most excited that they acquired this offseason? Oh, it's Jorge uh, Soler, man. I, I, I can't wait. Uh, I love the chicks dig the long ball, so does Goo. <laughs> <laughs> and again, this may not you know, come out on your guys' metric, Loveman and, and Shafsky, but I love swag. He's got that. He's got that menacing look. He's got the physique, and I just feel like the Giants have missed that for so long. And that's just one answer, but there's many more, man. And I'm just happy for the Bay Area fans and the Giant fans that out of nowhere, like magic, the Giants are exciting again, man. And this, I didn't see this three months ago, and I'm juiced, man, and I know you guys got to be. You're talking about you know being juiced here. You didn't see this a few months ago, Guru. It's because a few months ago, Almost everybody was out on Farhan Zaidi. We, you know, we, you know, we saw him, you know, fire Gabe Kapler, and we kind of wanted, you know, throw Farhan out with the bathwater too. You know, like that's where we were at a few months ago. Talk about just what you've seen. Has he has he completely flipped his narrative? Are we back on the Farhan Zaidi train? Are you back on the Farhan Zaidi train, or are you still kind of in a you had a good off season, but I need to see things play out kind of mode? Love me, great question, and I'm tapping myself on the back because. I'm nobody, but my favorite phrase is I react to new information. Mm -hmm. And Farhan has just went out, and everybody's been throwing rocks at him, and look what he's done, and he ends it. The dessert, the cherry on top is Blake Snell. So, Lubman and Shafsky, how can we talk about the defeats or, or the what-ifs, the ones that got away, and not look at this giant lineup, uh, the rotation, 
and now with the infusion. I heard you guys talking about uh, Jung Hoo Lee. I'm excited. So how can I not give Farhan his just due? Now, we'll see moving forward at the deadline if you guys need something. But, man, we've killed this man at every turn, mm. and then he just went to the lab and did this. So i got to give him his props. Mm. You know, I, I keep coming back to – you know, the, the, the hallmark of their winning teams, defense up the middle, pitching, and then timely hitting. Cause I think we forget we, oh, they couldn't hit. And, and yeah, there was, there were certain versions of the Giants 2014 where it felt, they felt very reliant on Madison Bumgarner dragging them across the finish line. But 2010, they hit a lot of home runs. 2012, I think was their best team overall. They had a lot of talent. Melky was on the team before they traded for Hunter Pence. If I were to say, Goo, you're allowed to bestow a career year on one person, you have the magic wand, and it can't be one of the rooks, who's the guy offensively that you would bestow the magic wand and say, you're allowed to have a career year if you want the Giants to have a big season? Wow, that is a phenomenal question, and it's a question that I have locked and loaded, but i got to reveal it right now, and that's Luciano. I hope if yeah, open one. now listen, I love I love Crawford, but I thought Crawford was moved for the next chapter, the young guys. If Nick Ahmed, who I'm not hating on, and I know he's a veteran, if he's in the starting lineup for the Giants opening day and not Luciano guys, to me from afar, that would be kind of what are we doing here? That would be deflating. Give this kid a shot at shortstop, and if he does get the shot, give me give me twenty two homers. And a 265, 255 average for Luciano and 60 RBIs. I would take that. He's oh, and slick, mm -hmm. and I want him to ball out. And can you guys answer my question? Do you think he'll be penciled in as a starting shortstop opening day? I don't know. Right now, my gut feeling, based on what I've just kind of observed in terms of on TV and just what I've read and from zero people I've talked to, I think he starts off in uh, in Sacramento. But, but Sam, oh can, let me interrupt God. you there. I know. Yes, you go ahead. <laughs> no, let me interrupt you guys. There is something about when you find the young, athletic, monster shortstop, it changes your whole outlook of your franchise. It's Absolutely. like finding a franchise player in the NBA. Think of Ellie De La Cruz. Think of uh, uh, O'Neal Cruz with the Pittsburgh Pirates. A Anthony Volpe, even for the Yankees. I know he he didn't play well last year, but they feel like they have a star. Think about Carlos Correa when the Astros brought him up. Like When you find an athletic freak, A-Rod back in the day, Derek Jeter, Nomar Garcia Parra, Tejada, it can change the optimism for your entire organization. That is so great. And, guys, I just got to – I'm going to go stand in here and throw the NBA at you. Jonathan Kaminga, regardless if we got the right or wrong. And, yeah, no, that's a four. You know, he <laughs> wanted to play early. He wanted to play last year against the Lakers. For, the, for whatever reason, it didn't happen. I'm just looking at Luciano like, man, could the Giants be doing that to him if he has to start and sack? But, Chesky, all those guys are studs you mentioned. And then the experience he got last year, like just – I'm not saying – He's Ozzie Smith, but just give the kid a crack at it, man, and see what you got. Because he, I brought up Kaminga because, to me, he's got the physical attributes mm. and he's got that swag, and the Giants need that, man. I'm with you. I absolutely agree here. The, the one thing I will say with Luciano that I would not be surprised if this does happen, and, and I brought this up in our last episode of Garlic Fries and Baseball, guys, but sometimes you have these, these big-name you know, young guys coming in, these rookies, and they're, you know, at the beginning of spring training, it's like, all right, you're locked into a spot on this team. And then they have a bad spring and they kind of give that spot to someone else. Uh, that happened to Madison Bumgarner back in 2010. He came in in that, that spring training. You're the number five starter. He had a very bad spring that year. And Todd Wellemeyer ended up being the Giants' number five starter that Todd year. Todd Wellemeyer? I know. Talk about names you haven't heard for a while. But about a month and a half later, Madison Bumgarner was on the big league roster. And we never looked back after, looked back after that. I mean, we could see a similar thing, thing here with Luciano where maybe he's not on that opening day roster, but maybe, you know, May 1st, May 10th comes yes. around. Uh, he's on that big league roster. And, you know, come September, we're like, wait, we were worried about Marco Luciano? Like, <laughs> baseball's hey. a funny sport that way, Goo. 
Sam, Sam, no, we no, need Guru point. to settle a debate. Guru, oh, settle okay, the debate here. Right here. Yeah, yeah, right you're the here. uniform guy, okay? Your Pittsburgh oh Pirates, right. your Pittsburgh Pirates, my San Francisco Giants have some of the greatest uniforms in the history of sports. Oh my God. Every era, they've never had a losing uniform combination. Whether we go to the the back into the the New York Giants days, or when they first got here to the '60s, the '70s with the pullovers, the '80s with the curvy attitude Giants, and then now their most modern ones. I cannot stand the City Connects. I find them to be totally useless. They have unbelievable threads throughout the history of their organization. Oh Where do you stand on the Giants City Connect jerseys? It is the biggest fail in the Bay Area sports in regard to uniforms in the last two decades. Thank you. How do you go from the <laughs> Jack Clark orange or, or the Johnny LeMaster orange in that black and come up with the, with the, the push-up? That's not even really your orange. You're disrespecting the core orange that the Giants have. Totally. So that city, can, is it coming back? I hope not. Stuff. I'm not sure. I mean, they're still winning in them, so I think oh, in that's stop okay. that. Stop that. Stop that. Well, hold on, hold on. You love me. Those are, I just can't do They look like an ice cream to pop the push up. <laughs> Come on. I mean, I'm still going to rock my City Connect Giants tag. Do, though, I need to add an extra layer yeah. onto this question then. Yeah. If we're having a jersey comparison here. Uh, the Pirates City Connect or the Giants City Connect? I'm looking at the Pirates City Connect it, right now. For those who don't remember, they look like oh, it is two all tones. yellow with yeah. a big PGH on the front. Guru, if you had to Sam, rock one I'm of those for your pickup real, game, I hope you guys know I'm always honest. I don't like it because Shasky, you said it. It does look like a softball uniform, but it doesn't veer off from the core yes. in regard to that yellow and black. I'll take that over the Giants. Giving me a light orange, I which totally is disrespectful agree. to the core orange. That's yep. just me. All right, all right. You hey, get one. Last thing. Last, I got to ask you this. Huh. I saw a video floating around from the Giants. I brought this up. Stani and I didn't know. There was a DJ in, in the ballpark. Yeah, DJ Umami. What's going on with the light? Is that so going to happen after a home yeah. run? No, I was there. I was there last night for the Bruce Mahoney, St. Ignatius versus Sacred Heart. It was awesome. It was a triple header. They have LED wow. lights now all throughout the stadium, and they're able to be able to turn them on and off much quicker than they have in the past. And oh my God. They, they're able to play with them. Let's just put it that way. They can <laughs> manipulate the lights significantly better. And I'm telling you, that ballpark has so many new features out in center field. I went. I had never been to the 415 section. I went to that, Kale Garden, all that. I went around the whole place. Goo, we brought the gloves last night. We were playing catch. Are you a glove at the stadium guy or not? I used to be, but in my old age, I just don't have a beverage in my hand now. So I'm <laughs> but I'm not mad at it. I'm not mad at the glove at the baseball yard. I love you, Goo. Uh, Goo, I yeah, really I appreciate you, you calling in today, man. This no made doubt, the show man. that much better. I'm glad Thanks, you buddy. enjoyed the Bob Marley movie, man, and I'll see you tomorrow, all right? Okay, you guys take it easy. All right, that was Daryl the Guru Johnson here with Matt Steinmetz every weekday from 10 to 2. Uh, on the other side, Shasky, we're going to wrap the show up here. Uh, do some uh, apples to apples comparison, and we got one more person calling in on the bat line. Someone who uh, big big Giants fan, but uh, will actually be attending Giants games this year. He's a fan of another orange and black team as well. Uh, we'll talk to them on the other side. It's Sam Loveman. It's Joe Shasky. It's Garlic Fries and Baseball guys. Make sure you're liking and subscribing to the podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Uh, more of your calls next on the other side uh, here on ninety five seven The Game.
Orioles last year. Audi Rushman, who, who we're going to see in yes. the home run derby. You're listening to Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys on 95.7 The Game. Well, if we're playing the, uh, the Audi Rushman drop, you know that can only mean one thing. It's Sam Lubman and Joe Shasky here on Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys. Oriole talk? Oh, it's all hardcore Oriole talk. And that's where we go to the Lions for Orioles insider and sometimes Warriors insider pre-game host, uh, pre and post-game host, Bonte Hill. You can also hear him on the morning roast along with Shasky and I. Bonte, thanks for calling in, bud. Good morning, man. Wait, Jackson Holiday. Why did they bring him up? Let's go O's, baby. Come on. Opening what? day, Camden Yards, who's coming with me? Who needs to be on the opening day roster more, Jackson Holiday or Marco Luciano? <laughs> well, Marco Luciano, you would hope to so. Me, well, <laughs> what about that sweet the other day, fellas? Wow. Marco Luciano, get him up here. Let's go, Butch. Let me ask you this question. The last time the Giants had a legitimate home run bopper, like, and I'm not even putting Luciano in that category just yet. I'm putting Jorge Soler there. But the last time was what? Moises Salou, Jeff Kent, and, and and Barry Bonds? Like, I love Hunter Pence, but he's not a bopper per se. Yeah, no, it's it's definitely Barry LeBar Bonds, and that's why I'm intrigued with this team. You finally got a guy who's known for power. We've been looking for him. He's just a slugger. Flat out, hey, I'm going to hit a pitch. 450 feet. I may strike out three times in a baseball game, but one of those ABs is going to result into a three-run homer. So having legit thump, I can't wait to see what he does with this ballpark. Oh, it's Hilaire. He's a World Series champion. He's got proven power. He's going to be the middle of the lineup. Instead of having a bunch of guys who may not be your traditional three, four, five hitters, you have a traditional cleanup hitter who's going to clean up a lot of pitches and a lot of the state pitches. I'm mm-hmm. excited for Hilaire. Jorge Soler, man, this is a big signing for the Giants. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, hopefully he could be the he'd be the first Giant since Jeff Kent back in two thousand two uh, to hit uh, thirty home runs, not named Barry Bonds. Um, it'd be wow. a great streak if he can break that. Two thousand and two. Uh, yeah, that was the last time a non wow, Barry Bonds oh name. That was the last time a Giants player not named Barry Bonds hit north of thirty home runs. That's how far back you got to go. That's how tough it's been. Um, and I don't know if that's just. A lack of just you just don't have those kind of power hitters versus the ballpark suppressing power. Um, you saw JD Martinez; he mentioned that the other day why he didn't want to come here though. But one thing we've been kind of asking: uh, we had Mark Willard call in, we had Daryl the Guru Johnson call in. We asked them, you know, who's the guy on this team who, if you could wave the magic wand amongst the veteran players uh, and have a career year, who would that guy be? So who would that guy be for you, Bonte? If you could wave your magic wand and make one veteran guy on this team have a career year, who's that gonna, guy going to be for you? Wow, that's a heck of a question. Um, wow, wow. That's, what, You're welcome. Wow, you yeah, Shas- Shasky uh, came up with this one. Yeah, just, you know. <laughs> oh, okay. I, I, maybe I'll give a love to too much credit there. No, I figured that <laughs> one. No, Shasky. Uh, <laughs> would I just think lineup? Like, would it have to be Lamont Wade Jr. or Wilmer Flores who are manning the spot at first base? Because... The way I look at it is, if those guys produce at first base, where they're going to platoon Wilbur Flores or Lamont Wade Jr., say they come out and scuffle and don't have career years, then I think the Giants and Farhan Zaidi will be looking at the New York Mets in case they struggle. Mm. What's going to happen with Pete Alonso? Can you pry him from the Ooh. Big Apple and place him at first base where you got Soler and Alonso batting back-to-back and providing 40 home run power and thump? So I'm looking at first base and Lamont Wade Jr. and Wilbur Flores have to have career type years because I think their positions are up in the air. If they don't produce, Farhan will look outside this organization looking for a first baseman. And I think Pete Alonso, if the Mets scuffle like they did last season, could be half for the right price. Well, you know, I look at the totality of the offseason and they've upgraded across the board. Um, manager, they've upgraded center field, they've upgraded third base, they've upgraded their starting rotation, they've upgraded their DH. Um, there's just a lot to like, you know, and guys fit more into their slots. Is this the most excited you've been about the Giants by far and away in the Farhan era? Oh, there's no no doubt. No doubt. And, and really, I don't, wouldn't even say I'm excited, Butch. More so intrigued. But now that I'm thinking about it here, say if they get out to a hot start, and I think the start is everything for them in the month of April, and they're in this race, right? You get to the trade deadline, and the Giants are hovering, and they're a factor in the National League. All of a sudden, I look at some of the pitching, right? Tristan Beck could be could be back in the second half of the season. Robbie Ray 
could be back in the second half of the season. And those are like built in trades for you. Those are those are bonuses. If you get anything yeah. out of Ray and Beck and they produce in the second half of the season, that's huge for the Giants. All of a sudden you have Logan Webb, Blake Snell, Kyle Harrison, and Robbie Ray. I don't think Giants fans understand the type of stuff Robbie Ray has and what he's done over the last two seasons. It's a reason why he's getting paid the money he's getting paid. This is a legit bona fide number three, number two type of pitcher in your rotation. So if you're in it by the deadline, you got Robbie Ray and Beck coming back. So now Farhan, all he has to do is focus on bolstering the lineup to get ready for the Braves, the Phillies, the Dodgers, who have deeper lineups in the Giants as of today. But Farhan can flip that. So, yes, I am excited. There's a lot of options here that Farhan has uh, at his disposal, disposal, and you have to give him credit. They went out there and they spent money. They tried to spend money in the past, but they actually closed the deal. Also, bona fide major leaguers here. So, to answer your question, but yes, I'm intrigued. But now, as we get closer and closer to opening day, I'm getting a little more excited about this team and the prospects and chances this team has to succeed in uh, 2024. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're mentioning Farhan there and Bonte. Of course, you remember the day when you and I went down to Oracle Park for that end of the year presser, and How you, you were standing, you were standing on his left, I was standing on his right, and we were kind of hitting him with the pincer move there of questions, uh, grilling him on on that season last year and some of the things he said in the past. I think that the overall attitude towards Farhan Zaidi that Giants fans had. That was probably, it's like Nadir. That was the low point that day when we were yeah. at that ballpark in that, in that dugout surrounded by everybody there grilling Farhan. Now where we're at right now, you're talking about how give Farhan credit. I'm intrigued by this team. I'm starting to get excited. Have we completely like flipped this Farhan narrative? Is it, is it cool to be in on Farhan's anxiety again? Or is there still a level of you did good, but there's still more to be done? Well, there's a little bit of that, Lubman, but there are, there's also a respect that they're saying, okay, he said he would change his ways. He said he would tinker his philosophy. It's so far so good on that front. He hires Bob mm-hmm. Melvin, who's obviously, obviously he's going to garner respect in that clubhouse. He's been around five different clubhouses, of course, a former major league player. So already it feels like the manager-GM relationship is a lot better. The GM respects, or the president of baseball operations respects the manager of the clubhouse. The respect factor Gabe Kapler didn't get, I think it was a huge deal with the players, mm-hmm. with the fan base. Everybody couldn't wait to get Gabe Kapler out of here. And I always wondered, why is he getting the figure? Why is he getting all the blame? But Farhan hiring a guy who has respect, whether or not we think he's a good manager or a great manager, that's beyond the point. He did hire a legit Major League Baseball manager. He mm-hmm. did sign Major League proven talent. And he's not waiting around for the guys like Luciano and Casey Smith. He's trying to win now, and he protected himself. If these guys ball out, right? And obviously Blake Snell and Matt Chapman, all these guys with the player options where they can opt out, it's not the worst thing in the world. You sign some guys, people around the league are taking notice that you sign these guys who have respect in other clubhouses. Now it'll set you get the next offseason. People are going to look at the Giants and say, well, we know they don't. They will spend money. They will give players player options to do what's best for them. And I think, therefore, Farhad will get a lot more respect. So I think the narrative is starting to shift here where Farhad's going to get a lot of credit. And if the Giants do win, people are going to flip. Oh, my gosh, the, the narrative's on Farhad's body. We may be talking about another extension after this season if the Giants go out there and ball out and make the playoffs. Wow. Let, let's have a winning April before we put the cart before the horse. But I, I hear you. You're, you're not wrong here. Things happen quick. Trent Bulky went from toast of the town, yep. GM of the year, to unemployed. Yep. You know what I mean? Very quickly. I think yep. people forgot how highly touted he was after that first year with the 49ers. Bonte, I don't think I've ever asked you this question. You're raising your daughter to be a Giants fan, and I'm sure you already have memories with her that are that are very special. What's your earliest or your favorite San Francisco Giant moment? Because I'm going to be taking my son, and I'll filibuster while you think about it. I'll be taking my son to his first game yeah. in two weeks um, out at opening day. And, you know, I hope to have many, 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 many of those moments. Um, what's your earliest or best Giants moment as a fan? Wow. Well, there's a couple. One, taking my mom to a game, sitting behind home plate, and her loving it, just watching the Cardinals clown the Giants. I think this was like 20... Maybe 2018, 2019, and wow. see her face mm. at the game, watching home runs after home runs. And then obviously, my first Father's Day, having my daughter there. And then later on, by her second game, she's running the bases in left field. Oh. So those moments right there, it's not the moments that I have, because I can say, wow, it's Kitty Lofton and David Bell and the <laughs> NLCS, where they, where they beat the Cardinals in the events in the World Series, or seeing Pete Rose honored as a top 10 player, the first time Pete Rose had been in a major league ballpark since he was banned from major league baseball. 
but really it's the moments that I share with others. And obviously my daughter and my mom are going to be right there as my favorite moments there. That. Father's Day and, of course, the year after when she's running the bases in the left field. And then my mom's sitting behind the plate like, wow, I can't believe it. Look at the bat. Look at him in the batter's box. I can't believe him. It's close. Look at him high five. And wow, he hit that. So those are my favorite moments right there. I love it. It's always the moments you share with family that always kind of hit harder than the moments that hit on the field. So that is that is awesome there. Bonte, uh, I know yep. you got a show to get to. TV Bonte's waiting. So yep. I appreciate you uh, yeah. taking a few minutes to call in and chat little Giants with us. And uh, this was a preview oh, yeah. for what the morning roast will be like for the next six months. Lots and lots of Giants talk, I, right? I, I'm telling you, man, this, this thing, I'm looking at the Giants here. If they can get off to a hot April, if you carry that momentum and all of a sudden more fans and you know, all of a sudden you go from having 20,000 fans to 30,000 fans and you get mm-hmm. those Friday nights popping again down at Oracle Park. And then you look at the second half of the season. If you're in the race, you're getting Robbie Ray back. You're getting Tristan Beck back. And then who knows where Luciano could be at that point. I think there's a lot of good things happening with the Giants right now. So I'm okay with Giants fans being optimistic about this season. I think good things will happen to the Giants in 2024. In or out on City Connects on your way out the door? Oh, I'm so out on those. Come on. <laughs> I think we've those. established that I'm the only fire. person who has something <laughs> nice to fire. say about the City Connects. So. I mean, the City Connects. Come on, man. Who are we full of, dude? This is a joke. I'm Thank rocking you, my man. City Connect hat right now. So, Thank Bonte, you, thanks a lot for calling in, bud. Really appreciate it. All right. Uh, I'll see you guys in the morning, man. All right. Yep. Talk to you on the show call later. We don't need a show call. We're yeah, good. no, we're good. Uh, well, we, gotta talk. we need to prep more. We gotta, we gotta figure out. We're gonna, we have a big Jonathan Kaminga show tomorrow. Um. Anyway, uh, before we get out of here, Shaz, I know the the everyone. Well, our, our longtime roasters, who I'm sure are listening to the show today, are uh, are they're they're getting it. So that's that's a little bit of roast. Can we right preview there. the NL West? Let's preview the NL West. I agree with that sentiment. Let's do that. All right. So let's start at the top. Uh, put the Giants to the side. Mm-hmm. The favorite to win the NL West is it's got to be the Dodgers. It should. And why? Be. Well, I mean, from top to bottom, they still have the best lineup. They still have one of the better rotations. Um, their bullpen is always a who knows every year. But again, I mean, Shasti, their their lineup starts off with probably the one of the best players in baseball that no one ever talks about enough is Mookie Betts. Yes. And then right behind him is, you know, Shohei Otani. And you can bet that he's going to have a great year this year. Um, and then right after that, you got Freddie. You like what I did there? And then you got Freddie Freeman right after. I mean, that is a one, two, three that is just like, if you built that on MLB, the show, mm-hmm. the video game's like, no, come on, let's be realistic here. Like, you, you can't do that. Um, and then they also, I mean, the rest of that lineup, you got, you know, Max Muncie, who I just, you know me, I can't stand him, but he is still a massive threat in that lineup, even if he comes in with, a, you know, a buck 83 batting average or whatever. Um, they got one of the best catchers in the division in the league in Will Smith. And then one uh, addition they made this offseason chassis that kind of got lost in the in the shuffle is Teoscar Hernandez, who's going to yeah. be their everyday left fielder. That dude is really good. Like, But he kind of, we don't really talk about him as much because we're all focused on Yamamoto and and uh, the Otani signings. That's another, like, that's going to add some length to the lineup there. Um, Gavin Lux comes back from the injury. Gavin Lux is going to be you know, back James there. James Altman like, will have another year under his belt. Chess, you make the argument Walker that Bueller returns. You can make the argument that Jason Hayward is the worst hitter in that lineup, and he's still a pretty dang good hitter. He's so okay. he's all right. He's no, good. so so he's okay. So the better, Dodgers but. are the clear cut favorites. Yeah. All right. So then who who should be again? That's fine. That doesn't mean that the season's over. Uh, I think that's a fair point of view, and I think most people would agree with you. Who would be the number two right now? Who's the team projected to be number two in the division? Honestly, I don't. This is where it gets. I think even a harder question is who finishes in fourth in this division right now might be the hardest question. But staying on second place right now, I mean, the 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 homer in me wants to say the Giants. But you look at the Diamondbacks, they're going to be a lot better this year. They added Eduardo Rodriguez uh, to their rotation, though. I think he uh, might have just gone on the IL. So that might actually mm-hmm. be a bit of a, a hiccup for them out the gate. Um, they still got one of the best one-two punches in the in the game, and Zach Gallen and Merrill Kelly. Um, the one thing though about the Diamondbacks is they're not going to surprise, and they're not going to surprise anybody this year. We're no. we're aware of how good they were, and it kind of took them a few months to get their act together. Get together last year, um, but you're have a full season of Corbin Carroll. We know how good he is. Lords Guriel Jr. is also very good. Eugenio Suarez, I love that addition for them. Uh, at third base, he's got some low uh, underrated power. I can tell Marte's very good. Perdomo's um, a, a solid player. Yeah, like they just the Diamondbacks. They have Alec they're going to be they're a good player. They're a good team that's going to get better. 
I think right now the Giants, the Dimebacks are going to be battling out for second place. Not it, the Padres. The Padres, I think, just because you look at their rotation, you Darvish does not impress me anymore. Okay. He's, what about Musgrove? Musgrove's good. I think he's a two-starter on a good team, okay. which is he is their two-starter. Dylan Cease is a good addition there. Um, the rest of that rotation, though, Michael King, Johnny Brito, solid guys. I don't know a whole lot about them, though. Uh, their lineup, though, it looks really good. You got Cronenworth, Bogarts, Hassan Kim, Profar, Tatis Jr., Machado. That's still a very, very good lineup. The X factor there, though, with the Padres is, and uh, they got Mike Schilt, who's running the show now there, and he kind of flamed out in St. Louis. Um, how are these guys going to get along? Uh, Machado, Tatis Jr., and Bogarts, they do not get along with each other. That was a big reason why things fell apart for them last year. You know, we were talking about, you know, Bob Melvin, you know, and you, you, the, the skepticism around him. You know, the Padres had a great team last year. Why couldn't Melvin get them in? A part of it is, be a big part of it is because their four superstar players all hated each other. They're all battling for the spotlight. They all want to be the guy. It created a toxic atmosphere in that clubhouse that, you know, on top of, the not so great atmosphere that AJ Preller fosters down there. I don't know if you remember that athletic piece they wrote about him last September. Um, he creates a very stressful work environment. And Preller, he's been there for what, seven, eight years? He's had seven, eight managers. Um, I mean, at what point do you have to look at him and be like, dude, I think you're the common link here. What's going on? So I think right now, Dodgers, that's your your number one in the division. Giants, Diamondbacks, I think both those teams battle it out. Both of them probably could very well get into the playoffs. I think Padres, they could be, you know, I mean, the Yellow West could have all three wild card spots if we're being real, but I think the no Padres doubt. right now are, are your fourth place team. They could. I have a hard time seeing that. Just in terms It's a of like, wild thing to say out loud, though. Yeah, no, I know. Uh, but it, you're not wrong in saying that. Are we dismissing the Rockies altogether? I am I am dismissing the Rockies. The only thing I'll give the Rockies is that they still play at Coors Field. Um, and I don't care how well the Giants have played there the last few years. That is a house of horrors for me. Um, anyone who's alive to see the Ryan Spielborgs game knows that there's no such thing as a safe lead. Um, how's that for a deep cut? Carlos Gonzalez in your grind. It's just still like hitting jacks. the Giants could be up 10 nothing in the bottom of the ninth, and I'm still going to be nervous. I mean, when the worst team in your division has one of the only true home field advantages in baseball, like that's still a threat. So the okay. Rockies are not a team you could sleep on. That said, they're still going to lose a lot of games. Um, but one of these four teams, Dodgers, Giants, Padres, D Diamondbacks, they're going to miss out on the playoffs because they did not take care of business against the Rockies. Best front office of the of the NL West is? Boy, that's a good question. I think it's still probably the Dodgers. The Dodgers. It's I mean, just look Friedman at their is the standard. Yeah. Look, yeah, look at their ability to land people. All right. Uh, what about best manager? I, that was my next question. Yeah. I mean... I don't, I, I don't want to give it to Dave Roberts. I've never really been a Dave Roberts as a manager fan. Um, Mike Schilt, not impressed with him. I think Tori Lovello in Arizona might I, I think be top. Lovello's he very might be good. top dog right now. Um, can I make a he quick? He did a problem? great job platooning third base and whatnot. And yeah. the, the young pitcher that they had step up toward the end but, of the year. But, I really like. But him. really quick here, we got a couple minutes here before we have to get out of here. Um, why not Bob Melvin? You know, and we said in the past he's never won anywhere. We we asked Spadoni a lot, you know, on the morning roast. Joe Spadoni, catch him on the pregame show five to six weekdays uh, in the morning. You know, he doesn't like Bob Melvin at all because Bob Melvin constantly fell short in the playoffs with those great A's teams. But, Chasky, I want to ask, why can't a manager with three Manager of the Year awards who's been to the playoffs with multiple teams, even if, he fall, even if he's fallen short, why can't that manager figure it out and put it all together with his fourth or fifth team and win the World Series? I mean, it, it, it could happen. I mean, um, it has happened. That's the Dusty Baker story. Well, He's a three-time manager of the year. He'd been to the playoffs with four different teams, fell out, didn't get to the end in either one of those, uh, with any of those teams. And then he got it with the Astros, and he ended up getting his ring. And well, we look at Dusty in a whole new space. Can I interrupt space. you for a second? Can I interrupt you? He took over a Giants team that was in complete disarray in 1992. We thought they had one foot out the door. He took over a Cubs team that hadn't won in 60 years. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like he took over the Nationals when they when they weren't very good. Like I think the the places he took over, we need to put some context in there. Like Bob Melvin inherited a pretty good situation in San Diego and a pretty good situation because of how active their mm -hmm. front office was. Well, he pretty had a tough situation, situation in, Oakland. in Oakland though when he took over. 
Okay. Yeah, he, was, right. he came in, I think it was 2011, when he came over and they fired Bob Guerin, and he turned things around pretty quickly. My point is... They did make a lot of moves. You're right. Bob Melvin's past, I don't believe, has to dictate his future. That I, I'll, I'll agree yeah. with. You know, I'll like, agree with that. You know, it, it, it's happened in the past where managers have struggled. They finally figured it out. They put it together, and it all comes, you know, and it, and it works out. So I'm not... I'm excited for Bob Melvin. I'm, I definitely think by the end of the year, we could be talking about him as the best manager in the National League West. I want to see it play out first before we crown him yeah. there. But I do believe the Giants got the best possible option for the job uh, this year uh, with Bob Melvin. So I, I'm Time very will excited. Tell. Time well, will tell. So number, we got about a minute left here, Shasky. What's your final thought here? Uh, my final thought is that it feels like the Giants' optimism and hope is sprung, is sprung anew. And it feels like Giants fans are legitimately, authentically excited about the year and about their team for the first time in a long time. And I'm right there with them. Let's hop on this bandwagon. Let's ride this wave. And let's see where this season goes. Absolutely. If uh, So their over-under is at 83.5. Shasky, uh, right now, how many wins? I'm going to say 88. I'm going yeah, to go 80. I'm going you know to be bold here. I'm going to go with 90. So if you liked what you heard today, this has been the Garlic Fries and Baseball Guys live Giants 2024 season preview. Uh, like and subscribe to the podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Thank you, everybody, uh, for tuning in and listening. Thanks to Mark Willard, Daryl Guru Johnson, and Vontae Hill for calling in. Thank you to you, Joe Shasky, for joining me today. Thank you to Matt Nahigian, who said yes when I asked him if he, he could do this. That was it. Literally, I had this long question. Can we do this? He was like, yeah, sure. Uh, that was the end of that conversation. So yeah. thanks, Coach, for allowing that. Uh, Sterling Bennett, thanks to you for coming in and helping us out behind thanks, the glass. Uh, Warriors Live is up next with the great Mark Grandy. So I know that's what everyone's been waiting to hear. Uh, so until then, uh, the Garlic Fries Baseball Guys podcast will be coming out every week. Like and subscribe so you don't miss anything. And uh, we'll catch you on the next one.
Warriors basketball is back. Steph Curry, Draymond Green, Clay Thompson, and Chris Paul. 60 minutes before every game, we get you ready for tip. It's Warriors Live, and it starts now. Yes, it does. Welcome into 95.7 The Game. Mark Randy with you. We're an hour away from tip-off in the Twin Cities. The Timberwolves hosting the Warriors today. Tip-off at 4 o'clock here on 95.7 The Game. Mark Randy with you here on Warriors Live, getting you ready for the Warriors against one of the best teams in the NBA, the Minnesota Timberwolves. They come in currently third place in the Western Conference, 48-22. and 22. Only a game and a half separates them and OKC and Denver, who are officially tied for first place in the Western Conference, although OKC just percentage points ahead. Uh, but Minnesota, one of the best teams in the NBA, and certainly before the regular season comes to a close, they could very well be the one seed in the West, although they are dealing with a major injury. Carl Anthony Towns has not played for a while and will not uh, play for at least a, a good stretch longer. More on that coming up in a little bit. Meanwhile, the Warriors enter as the 10 seed in the Western Conference. They're 36 and 33. They are a game and a half behind the Lakers for the nine. And the Houston Rockets, who also won yesterday, by the way, uh, they're only a game and a half behind the Warriors now for the 10. And the 10 is the final spot in the play-in, so the Warriors desperately need to earn some wins, and they're going to have to do it on the road against one of the best teams in the NBA tonight. All right, it is Warriors Live here on 95.7 The Game, presented by Xfinity 10G, the network made for streaming. Welcome in. Mark Randy with you as we get you set for T-Wolves and Warriors. This is the third time these two teams have met so far this year. If you remember, Minnesota won both of the previous two matchups, and they were consecutive games all the way back in November, uh, and they were both close wins for the T-Wolves. It was a 116-110 to win for Minnesota. That was a game where uh, the T-Wolves were uh, ahead by, I think, like 13, 14, 15 going into the fourth quarter. The Warriors put together a really nice fourth quarter. Stephen Curry scored nearly 40 points, uh, but it was just a little bit too little too late. For the Warriors in that one, they ultimately lose that one by six points. Then the next game, they face off again, uh, and that was the in-season tournament game. If you remember, inside of Chase Center, both these games were in San Francisco. This was on November 14th, uh, and that was the game where Clay Thompson got into it with Jaden McDaniels in the first like 90 seconds of the game. They were grabbing each other's jerseys and swinging each other around. Draymond Green came in support of Clay Thompson, and uh, he ended up grabbing Rudy Gobert around the neck and held on to him for a little bit too long. McDaniels was ejected. Uh, Clay Thompson was ejected. Draymond Green was ejected. Draymond Green also got suspended. But if you remember, Steph Curry also missed that game. So within 90 seconds into that game, the Warriors were without Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, and Draymond Green. So what did the Warriors do in that game? It forced them to go deep into the bench, and it was the first time we really got an idea of who Brandon Pajemski was at the NBA stage. It was his first real run, meaningful run, that wasn't you know in a blowout in the fourth quarter in garbage time. And he came in, and he led the Warriors in scoring that night, and he almost willed them to a win. It was a 104-101 to win for Minnesota in that game. So a win for the T-Wolves in the in-season tournament. Uh, but the Warriors, they, they saw a little bit of who Brandon Pajemski was at that point early in the regular season. Uh, and really, he hasn't looked back. He used that opportunity, which was kind of a random opportunity, uh, and he proved himself. And now he's a regular starter. And even if he's not starting, which has happened a couple of times recently when the Warriors have tried some new lineups, even when he hasn't been starting, he's one of the first guys off the bench and playing 25, 30 plus minutes every single night. Uh, and that was birthed really way back uh, in this in-season tournament game against these same Timberwolves uh, back in the middle of November uh, when Steph Curry was already out, and then there was the scuffle that uh, ejected both Clay Thompson and Draymond Green. So uh, it's been a fun season series, very um, active season series between these two teams. We'll see what tonight has in store against the Warriors and the Timberwolves getting set to do battle from Minnesota about an hour away uh, from tip-off here on 95.7 The Game. It's Mark Randy with you on Warriors Live. I'm with you until the bottom of the hour at 3.30 when Tim Roy and company uh, takes over live from uh, Minneapolis in the great state 
of Minnesota. Okay, let's begin here with our injury report, which is brought to you by Boxer and Gerson, Northern California's premier workers' compensation law firm, helping injured workers get their lives back for over 40 years. For more information, visit BoxerLaw.com. And I know a lot of the, the conversation, the discussion around the Warriors right now uh, is, isn't is relatively positive. There's a lot of negative energy right now. The Warriors might not even make the play-in because now the Houston Rockets have won eight straight games and they're only a game and a half behind the Warriors. If you are looking for some sort of positive, I do have it for you in the form of the Warriors injury report today. It's empty. Empty. Nobody on the Warriors injury report today. Good news, even though they haven't really been dealing with major absences lately, ever since Steph Curry came back from his ankle sprain, uh, what, eight days ago now on Saturday in L.A. against the Lakers. Uh, ever since then, the Warriors haven't really had major issues, but uh, Draymond Green had been on the injury report, if you recall, with low back soreness. It had put him on the injury report pretty consistently over the last week and a half or so. Uh, he is off the injury report entirely. Moses Moody, who was dealing with a, a an injury himself that kept him uh, on the injury report for a while. He's off the injury report as well. So nothing to report on the Warriors' injuries, uh, at least uh, as as of now. Meanwhile, the Timberwolves, they're dealing with a couple of, of major injuries. Carl Anthony Towns is out. Remember, he had a left meniscus tear, tore the meniscus in his left knee a while back and hasn't played since. The T-Wolves, their messaging has been pretty consistent, though, that they do hope to have him back perhaps at the end of the regular season or maybe for a postseason run. That would be huge for Minnesota, uh, who has been near the top of the Western Conference all season long. Uh, so we will have to wait and see there with Carl Anthony Towns. There are a couple of other T-Wolves on the injury report as well, and they're, they're other two biggest best players, you could argue. Uh, Anthony Edwards, he's questionable with a left middle finger dislocation slash sprain. And if you if you remember how he suffered that injury, uh, it's kind of wild. So if you were watching or maybe saw the highlight, uh, the T-Wolves jazz game from Monday, six days ago, when Anthony Edwards had an epic poster dunk all over Utah's John Collins, he ended up dislocating his middle finger on his left hand because as he went up the dunk with the ball in his right hand, he kind of warded off John Collins with his left and he ended up essentially with a with with straight fingers. It's not a punch because it wasn't a closed fist, but made contact with his hand into the face of John Collins as he's elevating for the dunk over him. And he fractured his left middle finger as a result of that. But he wasn't the only guy that that dunk did damage to. John Collins also dealt with a head contusion as a result. The middle finger of Anthony Edwards' left hand warding off John Collins on a crazy poster dunk, maybe the dunk of the season. I know Trace Jackson Davis would like a word for his dunk on Victor Wembanyama from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, but this dunk by Anthony Edwards was wild on John Collins, and it actually injured both guys, although they haven't really missed much time, if any, at all. Uh, just relatively minor injuries, and if it is a dislocation of, your off, of a finger on your off hand, it's not that big of a deal. Uh, for basketball players because you don't need it to, to line up your shot. It's just the guide hand, whatever. We can get into the semantics at some point later. Um, but that dunk by Anthony Edwards has landed him on the injury report ever since, although he hasn't missed a game. Uh, Rudy Gobert is also questionable with a left rib sprain, although uh, we do expect both Anthony Edwards and Rudy Gobert to play in this game here today. And that is our injury report, again, brought to you by Boxer and Gerson. Northern California's premier workers' compensation law firm. Uh, this is Warriors Live here on 95.7 The Game. It's presented by Xfinity at home or on the go. You'll get the fastest internet to all of your devices. Uh, so as a result of Carl Anthony Towns being out, uh, the Wolves are, they have been, and I imagine they will again tonight, they're going to start Naz Reed uh, at the four. And uh, he has been really, really good. Um this season and the last couple of years, and he's kind of been a Warriors killer. Every time you, you see the Warriors and the T-Wolves play, even if Cat is playing, Carl Anthony Towns is playing, and he won't today, dealing with that left meniscus injury, Nas Reed seems to uh, hurt the Warriors. 
Uh, he can space the floor for a big. He's big. He's tall. He's strong. He can affect shots inside. He gets on the glass. And it's just another really big body for the Warriors to have to deal with. Steve Kerr has uh, spoken pregame. Uh, and he did say that because of the T-Wolves' ability to go big, even without Carl Anthony Towns available tonight, uh, if you put Rudy Gobert alongside Nas Reed, uh, that's a lot of size that the Warriors have a hard time dealing with. I mean, just think back to Friday night uh, when the Pacers were in town. Miles Turner and Pascal Siakam were almost too much for the Warriors to handle. And I know the Warriors won the rebound battle in that game, and, and they didn't just win it. They kind of dominated it. But if you're really looking at it on a play-by-play -play basis and, and what was working for the Warriors and what was working for the Pacers... The Pacers controlled the paint, and they scored more in the paint. They kept the Warriors out of the paint as good as we've seen most teams do uh, all season long, if not better. And, and one of the better teams, I, I think, one of the better efforts for an opponent against the Warriors, keeping the Warriors out of the paint uh, on Friday to the Pacers. And the Pacers really are not one of the best defenses in the NBA. Now you go up against the best defense in the NBA, arguably, against a really big front line where the Warriors are generally a really small front line. Steve Kerr addressing that says there's a very good chance that he plays Trace Jackson Davis alongside Draymond Green at some point in this game today. And I think that would be a smart decision because if you don't, you're going to be asking Jonathan Kaminga to match up with Nas Reed, maybe some Andrew Wiggins, and Draymond Green to deal with Rudy Gobert. That part isn't necessarily so bad. It's kind of... Uh, what the Warriors have done a lot in the past. Um, but the other matchup, Nas Reed on, say, Andrew Wiggins, or Nas Reed on Jonathan Kaminga, um, that seems like a recipe uh, to get beat if you are the Golden State Warriors. So perhaps a little bit more of the Draymond, Trace Jackson Davis pairing, and the reason why Steve Kerr has been hesitant to go to that, despite uh, it seeming at times like maybe the way to go, maybe your best five includes Draymond Green, and Trace Jackson Davis, I think that's certainly true defensively. Uh, the only issue, and Steve Kerr has cited this, is it's sort of the issue the Warriors had run into when you play Draymond Green and Kevon Looney together. Because on the offensive end, you've got two non-floor spacers on the court together. Now, I will say Trace Jackson Davis' offensive game at this stage of their careers is a little more variable and, and deep than Kevon Looney's, and he gives the Warriors more offensively than Kevon Looney does, but it isn't in, in the name of floor spacing, and it makes it that much more difficult on Steph Curry and on Clay Thompson. I think Friday against Indiana is a prime example of this. Not that there was a lot of Draymond and Trace Jackson Davis minutes on Friday against Indiana, but you saw the shots not falling from everybody after the first quarter, and what did that do? Um... It clogged lanes, and the, the the Pacers were shutting down driving lanes. And that's what happens when you don't have a lot of floor spacers out there, when you don't have guys who are proven to be able to hit the three-point shot. It's why the development of Jonathan Kaminga's three-pointer is maybe, arguably, the, the most important development in, in terms of singular players developing skills, maybe the single most important development of the Warriors offseason in this coming offseason is Jonathan Kaminga developing that three-point shot. Because imagine how that changes the geometry of the basketball court. If Kaminga hits like 40% of his threes, 38, 39% of his threes moving forward, defenses have to respect that. It opens things up for everybody else. And what happened on Friday was nobody was hitting. The Warriors couldn't get to the rim as a result because the Pacers at times were almost daring Wiggins and daring Kaminga to shoot threes. Same thing with Draymond Green, although his percentage uh, from deep is up and up a really good amount this season. Um, it forced Steph Curry to try to play hero ball often in that second half take tough contested step back deep threes got a couple of them blocked by Tyrese Halliburton uh, so I get Steve Kerr's hesitance to go to Trace Jackson Davis and Draymond Green on the floor together because of how it limits you a little bit offensively uh, but there's no doubt I think it's your best four or five pairing on the defensive end and when you're going up against a really really big strong tall front line like you are today against the Minnesota Timberwolves even without Carl Anthony Towns, uh, you're almost forced to go to that. I'm not sure we're going to see Trace Jackson Davis in the starting lineup, 
Um, but we're probably going to see maybe a bump up in minutes for him tonight. Obviously, it depends how the game goes as well, and things can adjust on the fly. Uh, but expect more Draymond and Trace Jackson Davis minutes together tonight. And that does bring us to what's on tap tonight here on Warriors Live on 95.7 The Game. What's on tap is brought to you by Farmers Brewing. Have you tried Farmers Brewing yet? If not, it's time to put your lips on a farmer. And this is an offensive challenge for the Warriors like few others this whole season. Uh, Despite a rough final three quarters offensively versus the Pacers on Friday, the Warriors have been a top 10 offense for the majority of the season so far. Um, But now you're going up against what you could easily say is the best defense in the NBA. A number of metrics back that up. The most simple one, uh, which team allows the fewest points per game in the NBA? That is the Minnesota Timberwolves. They allow about 106.5 points per game. By comparison, the Warriors' last opponent, the Pacers, uh, the third worst. They allow the third most points per game to their opponents, about 120. Uh, And the Warriors were not able to get to that number last time out as they lost to the Pacers, uh, 123 to 111. So a subpar offensive performance for the Warriors against a relatively porous defense last time out. Now the challenge steps up because you're on the road in Minnesota against perhaps the best defense in the NBA. It's not just about points per game as well because that is highly indicative of pace, and Minnesota does not get up and down a ton. They like to slow things down and play in the half court. Generally speaking, if you have fewer possessions in a basketball game, you're going to score fewer points. Uh, But if you look at just on a field goal percentage basis, This T-Wolves defense is also the best defense in the NBA. Their opponent field goal percentage is 44.8%, the best mark in the NBA. They also have the best defensive rating in the NBA. Long story short, this is the best defense in the entire NBA. And what's on tap is going to be the challenge of the Warriors offense, which has been largely good this whole season, to try to go up against a really, really good Minnesota defense. All right, this is Warriors Live. Mark Randy with you here on 95.7 The Game presented by Xfinity at home or on the go. You'll get the fastest internet to all of your devices. Interestingly enough, um, the Warriors have been a really good road team lately, and I know we talk a lot about their record on the road as a whole and compare it to what they've been doing at home. They're 18 and 14 on the road. They're now sub 500 at home, which is just ridiculous at this point in the season that the Warriors are a sub 500 basketball team at home and still four games over uh, on the road. Uh, But it's kind of been amplified recently. The Warriors have won 10 of their last 12 road games and their only losses uh, during that stretch were on March 3rd, the, the blowout loss at the hands of the Celtics in Boston. And that game was over essentially at the end of the first quarter. The Warriors waved the white flag early in that one. And then Uh, The 13th, so what, 11 days ago now when you were in Dallas when both Steph Curry and Draymond Green did not play. So for the Warriors, their last 12 road games, the only two times they've lost were against the best team in the NBA on the road who basically never loses at home. And, uh, you know, it was the end of a road trip and maybe the Warriors were already a little bit checked out, whatever you want to say about that one. A loss, whatever. And then the only other one was against a quality team in in Den or pardon me in Dallas and the Mavericks on the road when you're playing without both Steph Curry and Draymond Green. So this Warriors team, they have made it a habit of winning games on the road. They've been really good at it lately. For whatever reason, it has not come together at home, but they've been really, really good on the road. However, uh, the T Wolves are a little bit of a different beast. Forty eight and twenty two on the year, third place in the Western Conference. And they've got a 24 and 9 home record. 24 and 9 at home are the T Wolves. And uh, that's where this matchup is in Minneapolis tonight. So the Warriors will see if they can make it 11 of 13 wins on the road. Um, but it's going to be a tough challenge. And this might be the Warriors' best road win of the year if they are able to get it done tonight. All right. Let's get to our take it to the bank prediction, which, as always, is brought to you by Fremont Bank Full Service Banking. No compromises. I'm going to I'm gonna say, I'm going on a little bit of a limb here, and I'm going to say that uh, my take it to the bank prediction is a poster dunk at some point tonight uh, because you got a couple of the high flyers in the association tonight going at it. Between Anthony Edwards and Jonathan Kaminga, you've got two of the most explosive leapers in the league. 
Jonathan Kaminga, believe it or not, has the 11th most dunks in the NBA this year with 131. And you look at the list, I mean, there's some of these the suspects you would expect, like Giannis and Anthony Davis. Um, but generally, you've got a lot of centers in there. Jared Allen is one that's up there. Uh, Jalen Dern of the, the Pistons is up there. Generally speaking, you got seven-footers. You got the the wild exceptions like Giannis, although he's very close to being a seven footer, but doesn't play the center spot. And then you got Kaminga, the eleventh most dunks in the NBA, plays more of a four in the Warriors system, but around the league would probably be more of a three. A hundred and thirty one dunks this year, the eleventh most in the NBA. And on the other side, Anthony Edwards, he only has the fiftieth most dunks in the league this year, fifty nine total dunks. But the percentage of those 59 dunks that are epic posters over the top of someone uh, in crazy fashion, uh, it's very high. Probably not a higher percentage of his of, of anyone's dunks or uh, posters quite like Anthony Edwards. And the one we were talking about earlier where he both injured himself and the guy he put on the poster. He dislocated his left middle finger and gave John Collins a head contusion on his last poster dunk last week on Monday against the Jazz. If you had not seen the highlight, uh, I recommend checking it out because it is arguably the dunk of the year. It was incredible. So I'm going to tell you, it's a little bit out there in terms of, of a prediction. Uh, we're going to get some high-flying highlights in this game today. Uh, Jonathan Kaminga and Anthony Edwards are two of the prime suspects. Uh, so watch out for those two, uh, Jonathan Kaminga and Anthony Edwards. And I think specifically for Jonathan Kaminga, he needs a little bit of a bounce back game here today because uh, he struggled last time out. And uh, he's getting to a point now where he rarely has consecutive poor shooting games. Uh, and I'm not worried after one bad shooting night for Kaminga that anything is going to snowball here. He has been so consistent over the last handful of months that I, I expect him to come right back out and play well. But no denying, he was 4 for 17 from the field on Friday. Uh, he's got to bounce back. And the Warriors would love a win today. The, the Lakers are in action tonight against the Pacers. They are in L.A., so that game tip, tips off later at 7. Uh, but the Warriors, uh, they need to win because the Houston Rockets have won eight games in a row. They are hot on the Warriors' heels. And as we speak right now, uh, the Warriors are a game and a half behind the Lakers and a game and a half ahead of the Rockets. So you are as close to getting to the 9 as you are to falling to the 11. You're smack dab in the middle as the 10 seed right now. You do have the tiebreaker with Houston. Houston has another winnable game coming up next for them, and you've got a really tough five-game road trip on the horizon. you got Minnesota today, Miami on Tuesday, Orlando on Wednesday. Those three are really tough. Don't, don't sleep on Orlando. We talk about Houston being the hottest team in the NBA. Orlando is right there as well. They are playing fantastic basketball. Then the Warriors close out the, the road trip with Charlotte and San Antonio. Those better be wins if you are the Warriors, especially if these first three prove difficult. Minnesota tonight, then Miami, and then Orlando. All right, that'll do it for Warriors Live here today on 95.7 The Game. Warriors Live is presented by Xfinity at home or on the go. You'll get the fastest internet to all of your devices. It's Warriors and T-Wolves coming up next. Tim Roy standing by live in Minnesota. He's got you covered all the way up until tip-off and through the game on 95.7 The Game.